podcastjuice.net. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Prince Podcast here on Podcast Juice. My name is Michael Dean. Joining me today is Mr. Big Sexy and Sax. Sir, how are you? Ah, uh, Mike, I am well. It was a rough weekend. Court got a bit of a, a smack by, by a judge on Thursday, but it's all good. I recovered nicely, and let's do this. All right, all right. Uh, I thought of you when I saw the Kathy Griffin uh, press <laughs> <laughs> I was like, would, would Big yeah. Sexy take that job? But hey, you never know. Yeah, I, I can't do that for Kathy on this one. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, moving on, let's stay focused. Uh, We've got a great show in front of us uh, today. We got another special guest. And you know what? You guys know when I say that, it's going to be something. So this is going to be something great. We are joined today by Mr. Scotty Baldwin. Scotty, how are you, sir? I'm well, sir. And you? I'm doing good. I'm excited. I I was a little nervous, uh, I have to admit, uh, doing this interview. Why? Because... um, as I researched your name, and I really was like, I remember hearing about this guy, and I'm like, okay, this is gonna be one of those ones you gotta really kind of be on your A game, Mike. So I'm, I'm a little, uh, I'm on my fanboy a little bit here. So excuse me, uh, as I geek out. But uh, some of you may know Scotty, uh, some of you may not. But who he is, he is, he has been, and he is. He's the sound guy. I always call him. He's the sound guy. And when you go to the concerts and you go to see Prince in the last few years. The guy that's handling the sound that you hear at the venue, Scotty's in control. He's the man on the control board. He's handling the mix. What do they call you? The, uh, the front of house sound? Is that what it, the definition is? They call it front of house, and that's an old term. Um, it, but it, it's still it's still uh, pertinent. And So I control everything the crowd hears. I sort of represent what the crowd wants to hear and, and make it palatable for the, the audience members. Then you have the monitor engineer which is the one on stage that mm-hmm. people would look at or yell at in, in a lot of cases <laughs> and to turn things up and down for the musicians they mix Hurry for up. the musicians i mix for the uh for the uh, audience so so was it the monitor back in the the uh i don't know in the 80s and 90s hip-hop shows and th- those guys would sometimes get beat up or, was that the monitor guy that they were always cussing and yelling? yeah it was usually the monitor engineer yeah man that's a tough job yeah, yeah that is that is the the only job <laughs> tougher than the one I had for many, many years with Prince was, was, the, was that job. That's, that's an unenviable job. Well, I have to say, I am in awe of your abilities uh, because quickly, I've had a very short stint of being in a studio situation sometimes. And uh, there's always the, the, the engineer or the sound guy. He's always like the smartest guy in the building. It's like, it's that guy. He's a very humble person usually but he is like the go-to person he's the one that makes everybody sound great so i have much respect for what you do um because again the sound guy is he's the man that makes us all sound perfect and uh when the sound is a problem he's the guy to go to and you've seen concerts and footage of prince and he you know, he he doesn't seem like he uh takes it lightly when his sound is improper so maybe we'll get into some of that conversation but as I ramble on, Scotty, uh, I want to thank you for joining us. And man, I would just like to really just start at the beginning. Um, so let's set the stage. Can you tell us where you are from, actually? Where are you, where are you, where are you hail from? I'm, I'm a, a St. Paul boy. I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I didn't have, I, I wasn't really plugged into music other than being a, a born in 1967. So I had a lot of the early and mid and late I, I had a lot of the 70s in me and there was a lot of great music throughout the 70s and early 80s and I ingested it all but I never played I didn't really play until I don't know a little bit after high school I tried I tried becoming a guitar player and that just didn't hmm. take I found I loved taking guitars apart and I was I was good at the technical aspects but I wasn't much of a guitar player and um, so it, for me it was I, f- I found really quickly that I was going to be in a if I was going to stay in music and plug into music, it was going to be in a technical uh, support role. So, like, how did you uh, first get into the to the ability or the opportunity to do sound, or, or was, did you uh, do sound for shows, or were there like some studios? I mean, how did you get into that? Well, uh, once Michael Bland 
uh, Prince's uh, former drummer, Michael Bland, saw me. I think I was I was a technician, guitar technician for a, a, a band in town. And he saw me and he watched the way I worked. And he hired me um, because of the way I worked. And um, my I had, a, I had a lot of methods and I had everything was really all the eyes were dotted and T's crossed and I had everything really straight, right? Everything was very in order. And he loved that and um, because that's the way his mind works. Okay. And so he hired me to be his drum tech. And as I would, I would set up his drums and then I would sit around in the clubs that he would play in Minneapolis. And, uh, um, and I would, of course, stand by the sound engineer. And I had one particular sound engineer uh, uh, named Cody Anderson who was hugely influential in me just starting to run sound. He, he, um, big sexy. I know you, you're into sound and you've always wanted to become a sound engineer. And what, that, what attracts people to that, I think is the sense of being involved in the music, but in a way that's maybe, you know, it doesn't have to directly be involved in the artistry. It's the technical support of that artistry. And that, mm. that appeals to a lot of people. Um, and Cody just encouraged me to, uh, it was a two night stint every week at a bar that all the Prince fans know called Bunkers. And that's an infamous bar now, or it's a famous bar now. And uh, I would just stand behind Cody and and he said, listen, you're going to start taking over for me on the second night. You're just going to do it. I want you to, the mix will be already be on the desk. You just do what you'd like to do. And he encouraged me to jump in even and uh, and do what I thought was right. And so I had good, I had a good tutor and somebody who was encouraging. It's It's like any other aspect. It's if you have someone that's willing and available to teach and, and listen and you can from whom you can learn you can go far fast now, now how old how old were you during this time um early 20s i must have been oh maybe i don't know it was 1992 93 oh, okay. when i was really starting to get into sound okay and um so i i don't God, i'm old enough where i need it not only a calculator, I'd need an abacus just to find out. <laughs> I, I was probably, I was probably mid twenties and okay. early to mid twenties. And, um, uh, and Sheila E would be, she would frequent the club and she would watch Michael play. A lot of people wanted to see Michael play. Okay. And Sheila and I became friends and, um, she told me one day she, as is her style, she just said, I'm taking you, you're going, you're coming on the road with me. You're mixing me on the road. Oh, wow. And I and I was very nervous about that night, but I did. I quit Prince. Uh, I quit as a drum tech. I became her front of house engineer, and she uh, she gave me the opportunity to do it on a bigger stage and travel around and and do it. And then I caught the attention of Seal and others. So I sort of had a, I guess you could call it a meteoric uh, rise right into um, high, high level artists. I didn't have to work my way in through a sound company or being an assistant or working in a studio or anything like that. I sort of showed my musical abilities and the technical support of those abilities right, right away. So I started with Sheila, um, then jumped right in with Seal, and, and then I was going to get out of the industry, and then someone saved me from that. Okay, <laughs> this is crazy. I want to back up a little bit. So uh, Sheila E. Let's, let's put some respect on her name for a second. That's Sheila E. She comes to you. You're in your mid twenties. I was going to ask you. Obviously, you are in Minneapolis. Like, how were you a Prince fan, or how much did you, were, did you know about Prince and stuff before this? I knew I knew quite a bit about him because he, just being from Minneapolis, you, there's a certain awareness that we all had at the time of who he was and what he was and what he was already and what he was going to become. And ultimately be known as so he and he supplied as i wrote once in some publication that he sort of supplied the soundtrack to my life mm. it, he was always on and always around and sort of part of things and i had all the vinyl uh, um i didn't have some of the early vinyl but i uh, certainly listened to wore out 1999 and and then when purple rain came out i was I, that was right in my in my wheelhouse as far as being a fan i wasn't an early adopter of Prince, but I, he was, I was always aware of him, but then I became a fan around the 1999 album when I was still in school. Interesting. So, I mean, just to go back to the background part again, was the Minneapolis sound, I mean, were you obviously aware of, because when you said 1999 and you had the time and different things, I mean, you as a younger person, did you see or were you aware of like what these guys are doing is is the shit like it's just kind of becoming the the sound of the day or something is 
Oh yeah, we everyone sort of knew it in in the area because everyone was curving their sound. Everyone was sort of leaning toward that sound. You had Terry and Jimmy doing their thing, which was a direct result of what Prince was doing. And Prince tried to cultivate artists to sort of have this sound. He was very wise about his implementation of his sound. He was very aware of it, supremely aware of how the kind of effect he had on all people at all times throughout his entire life. So he, he, he knew what he was doing. And I think that's true of any, um, anybody who's really a genius they're they're aware at all times they have a high awareness level and he was creating his own competition in a way by coming up with right. the time Sheila was a supplemental Sheila wasn't necessarily Sheila E wasn't necessarily necessarily a competition she was support uh, vanity six was support um, the time was the competition so he 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 manufactured his own um, width if you will mm-hmm. he just he he didn't have to do it by himself. He put a lot of artists out there with that sort of sound. Okay. And, uh, and it was evident because then as soon as Terry and Jimmy started to produce other people, uh, you heard that sound, not necessarily with, well, Janet had the sound, but they, they, they were very careful and thoughtful in how they took it their direction as well from a production standpoint. Right. So, um, but we were all aware of it. Everyone was aware of it. Okay. And then in terms of like, so when you start to working with Michael Bland, uh, is this in 1990, 91? Um, this is around 1990 when he hired me. I think the end of 1990 when he hired me as his drum tech. And he, and at so, this, and, oh, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. He, and he, he was just joining. He had just joined, I think it was, oh, it was, was with a bat. I'm not sure exactly what his first encounters were. Prince had been looking to pick him up for a while and um and i think the batman stuff was the first stuff he as, as a matter of fact saturday night live wasn't that the first yeah. performance that he yeah. did with yeah. prince if i remember correctly yeah and so i joined really shortly after that okay. i think i joined it during the new tour or at the end of it and um and michael brought me on and and just had me come out to paisley park so i just sort of started to become this person that was behind michael and Michael, because of his size and his incredible knowledge of music, he was always respected by Prince, always respected the musicians that could play their instrument better than he could play it. Mm. So, um, And that's a tall order, because especially when he's playing it in his style. But someone like Michael, someone like uh, Sonny Thompson, people who really could, that Prince was... They, he had quite a bit of respect for for Michael, and so I was sort of protected in a way, just sitting back into the side of Michael. And and uh, at one point, Prince just said, "All right, you know, who's your man?" And he said, "Oh, that's Scotty. It's my drum tech. He's great." And he said, "All right, well, you, you should probably take him on tour." And it was that easy. Oh wow! And so did wow. you? You went on the new tour? Were you going out for those dates as well? Or? I don't think I remember doing some. I don't. I don't remember if I was on or at the end of the new tour i have some memories but of that but it was really um uh when we started to work on um stuff after that i started to do tv shows and i would do any any sort of one-off things that that prince would do i'd be involved in that and uh brought in a colleague of mine to run all the drum electronics back then it was a huge electronic drum setup Mm. Um, now we can do it all with a laptop and we do um but back then it was a, oh, I don't know, a 48 inch high rack full of Emacs, full of old samplers and, and, right, right. and trigger units and, and, and pedals. And it was enormous back then. Yeah. Can we just sidestep just for a second? Because I, I, sure. that stuff sort of fascinates me. <laughs> and I always look back when I, and, and we'll jump into Revolution, but I look at, you know, when the Revolution, they had a lot of the triggers and things. And, and with Michael B., when I remember listening to the stuff that they were doing, it was heavy like there would be like the sample drum track and then he would be playing feels and stuff and all these different things i mean how difficult and was that your job to sort of connect his stuff with that and that he'd have access to hit the, the pads and things how 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 did you get into that that's i'm just so fascinated it, by that it, it 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 had to be with prince's music there's such a signature sound to the drums um uh, that lynn lm1 uh, drum computer which is mm-hmm. what it was at, actually named the, everyone knew it was loops. So Michael had to play with that. And he, he didn't, um, he was very, 
he was very particular about how he wanted to integrate himself with the sounds. Uh, so some sounds we'd put just up on pads, um, and others. And Michael would. It was really a, a wonderful thing to be behind Michael and watch him start and stop the loops because he would start him with his right foot on a pedal that was just to the right of the kick drum pedal. And for people that aren't technical about it, this won't fascinate them. But to people who are, this is kind of fun to to learn about. Um, when, when Michael would start a, a loop from, let's say, When Doves Cry, which is a very signature uh, sound, that loop, the drum sound, um, he, would be, he would be missing the kick drum when he would start the loop with his right foot. So in order to make there be a kick drum at the same time as when he started it, he would actually, I actually sampled his, my idea was to sample his kick drum and then put it on a pad over to the left. So with his left hand, he would, he would hit a pad with a kick drum on it at the same time his right foot would start the loop and then he would play along with it. And if he have to, ever had to do a stop, he would stop it by stopping the loop with his right foot and hitting a pad with his left foot. It was a very, wow. very um, mentally, uh, it, was a ch- it was a challenge. Well, really not a challenge for Michael because he can do, he's Dr. Octopus anyway. But he, <laughs> he, would, he had to sort of assimilate, he had to make sure that that sound remained thick and, and large and sound really, really big at all times. So you can never, never have those things sound skinny. They all have to sound really thick. And there's a challenge to that. And we had access back then anyway, when I started with Prince, we had access to the vault and we had access to, um, all the loops in their original state. Oh, wow. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. I always, I listen to some of those concerts now, you know, they come out on bootlegs and stuff and it's just like, man, like it's just crazy to me. And there'll be the, the rare occasions sometime where they'll, they'll get off of the loop a little yeah. bit and Prince will say yeah. something and they jump into it. But I'm just always fascinated. I said, like, that has to be so technical. But he's still funky. At the same time, it's like he's still yes. playing, you know. So it's just, ah. but anyway. Yeah, and it's hard to reserve. It, it's hard. Prince was, there's nobody better at, at making that, um, it, it, making a transition from a being off or a mistake into something that's intentional, right? Mm. So, Prince would know when to uh, when to break things so that he could he would just say on the one and and it would stop and then he would he would say oh y'all don't understand right? and <laughs> what he was what he was doing is is he was just correcting that and right. and getting it back to where he could start again but he was a master at disguising any sort of mistake it there there yeah. were mo- no mistakes I mean as far as Prince was concerned it, it you could make them but you always made them in pairs and you. To the, so that they looked intentional, and and then you, um, and he could get us back on course. He could sort of sheepdog everyone back in, onto course. Yeah, that, that, that's what I call the player skills. Because you know, when a real cool cat sort of trip up, he knows how to do the little stut, stutter walk to make it look like that's, he intended to do that. I was like, that's, that's Prince. Right. Like, that's right. He ain't gonna never get caught out there. It's always he's just a mask. That's I mean, again, you could go in a whole conversation of just his showmanship and like how fine-tuned it was where everything became a part of the show no matter if it was a misstep or you, you made it a part of what it was and it was just so masterful at that it just it fascinates me yeah. um all right so and he never and he never had he, he never had um through all this and i i don't think i've ever even said this but he through the entire time that i knew him all almost 30 years 28 years or 27 years he he had never hit a bad note. I'd never heard him once hit a bad note. Never. Mm. And that's with monitors far down on stage through his phase of, uh, through his, uh, the time he was in your monitors, um, when he was close to monitors, when he was back far away, he just, no matter where he was on a circular stage, he never hit a bad note. And there's something there that just, mm. um, never flat, never sharp, always intentional. Forgotten lyrics, I'd seen that before. That, that happens, but that happens to the best of them. That's a, and there's a way out of that as well. Mm-hmm. Y'all sing. Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Scott, no. You brought up something that's very interesting to me, and we're going to jump around, but I want to make sure I kind of double down some of the things you're saying here. You talk about him not, you know, having a bad note, and, you know, you mentioned the in ear in ear monitors. Now, yes. I don't know, for me as an observation, and I've had a very brief stint uh, being on the road, but. Seeing a lot of the, the, pe- the singers and stuff now, they all have the in ear, in ear, mo- you know, monitors and things of that nature. And I'm assuming that is so that they can probably hear themselves a little better and things. But I, w- I want to ask you, as somebody who's been around this game for a while, why is there the need for them to have that now when they didn't have it? I don't know, 
25, 30 years ago? Is it just because the technology didn't exist? Or is that something to do with the types of singers that are out? I'm just curious what your thoughts on this is. That's a very, very good question. There's a, there's, um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of reasons for it. The, one of which, and not the least of which, is being financial. Um, when you're hauling around a lot of big, heavy monitors and big, heavy amplifiers to run those monitors and, and um, e- equalizers and things that are all in the chain of, and all those things need power as well, that, that becomes a lot of weight, hmm. right? And physical weight and, you can, and truck space. And if you can do all that, without all these boxes all over the place and amps and equalizers and, and soundboards, just big stuff, you can do it for cheaper and cheaper is better. Okay. Right. As, as long as the quality remains the same, people don't really look at that aspect. The musical side of it is that you're, the experience for the musician is always going to be better when it sounds the same no matter where they are. Mm-hmm. So you can have someone go all the way, all over a stage and in their ears, it sounds exactly like they're in one spot. It just never changes. And the technology is really caught up. I and mean, we've had headphones forever and we've had transmitters forever. So we could have, you know, done this forever. But it's just that the um, how to mold people's ears and how to use the the um, technology to mold um, people's inner ear to, to be really, really custom fit and sound great and shrink, shrink the size of the electronics down to put multiple um multiple um, drivers inside these earpieces and they sound fantastic and they're really inexpensive now. So there's a financial side of it, but also from a musical standpoint, it just sounds better. It's more consistent and, um, and it looks better, cleaner stages. um, Mm -hmm. Big sexy. I know you've worked with journey years ago and journey now is to the point where um, they don't have guitar amps or, or, monitors or anything at all on stage they all of it is direct all of it goes to their ears it's very efficient um most bands are doing that now and and um and it's about time because it, it's just more musical experience for them okay okay that makes sense to me um well let's let's jump back to uh sheila e it's kind of where we left off and you and you got to work with her now going on the road with sheila was this the first time you actually went and did shows or had you done a few away shows with the Prince camp? No, I'd done shows away with the Prince camp, but um, as a sound engineer, it was the first time I had done that. And okay. it was with Sheila. And that was, um, that was a little, a little intimidating. It was a club tour, although the, the band was great. It was her brother, Peter Michael Escovito singing and playing drums uh, for Sheila. It was, um, I forgot who Eddie, Eddie M was the sax oh, player wow. yeah, yeah. in the band. Uh, Eric Leeds was in the band. Oh, wow. uh, Seku Bunch, uh, they're they're really good musicians. That was a that was a, a jazz. It was the E Train. Sheila's E Train was a jazz oriented group. But we did all we did her hits, and it was a really good experience for me because the pressure there wasn't a lot of pressure. It was clubs, but I um, but I learned a ton on that on that first tour. Were, were you familiar with? Uh, I assume you had some familiarity with the boards. From your pri- previous work locally doing sound, I mean, how we, how easy was that transition, or was it an easy transition to say, okay, come into a place you had never been before, and is this the sound check or whatever, where you sort of assess, you know, the sound of the room and things of that nature? That's a good question. Um, it, back in those days, it was it was all analog, of course. There were no digital, or there wasn't a proliferation of digital consoles at that point. So running into one was very, very rare if at all. And um, back in 94, when I started to run Sound on the Road for, for Sheila E. And um, so, yeah, every every different every day I would come in and I would have to do this. I would have to recreate the show. And it was all just done on one scene. right? It was just one desk. And I just had to mix and really be hands on mm. from song to song, changing effects. And I was always very good at doing effects and making sure they were just like the record and coming up with my own things. And I'd bounce them off Sheila and she'd hear them and either we'd rehearse them during soundcheck or I'd just do them during the show and then she would play off of them. And, and she, I have to give her credit. She gave me a lot of latitude and a lot of, um, a room to reach and explore and kind of become who I was, who see, she saw me becoming, I mean, she's the one who changed my name to Scotty P anyway. So she was sort of building me, building my sound character the way that, that I had been, built musically by Prince in the in the previous three or four years. Wow. Okay. And you, you mentioned something, and because I just, again, I want to put these things in context for people. 
uh, when you talk about an imprint or, or, or uh, the settings and things of that nature. So when you add an analog board, you have to come in and say, okay, I know this is supposed to go here, and let me turn this there that. Is it different now that they're digital where you can just sort of save all of these settings, and do you just bring your board with you? Or I'm just curious how that works. Well, I, I don't bring... My, I don't own a board myself, and um, I have the certain board that I prefer using. Okay. And um, so I have a library of all these artists and all these effects and all these things that I've done from years prior, and I can take them right onto the next tour and utilize those special effects that I've written, special settings and mm. channel strips and things like that. And it does make it easier, and I think more – it can do two things. It can make people complacent and make them rely up – engineers rely upon what they've already done without really doing the homework on the music. Um, it can also benefit by bringing things that are that have been musically sourced and bringing them to a show that needs that kind of um, musicality. So it, it's got its advantage and disadvantage. You never want to lean too heavily on what you've already done. You've got to keep it fresh and, and revise and, and learn, keep open to learning. But um, uh, it, it's certainly much better and more precise now. And the, the audience demands that. They want to hear... They want to go to a um, Katy Perry show or or, um, or 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 a Prince show up until his death that they wanted to hear it sound like the record. Right. Oh, right. Only owing the change would only be if conceptually the artist said, "I want to do something different." Gaga, Lady Gaga, was very good at that. She would say, "I know this one sounds like this, but Scotty, I want to do this." So she had very um, her, she had very descript- she would use descriptions on how she wanted it to sound. She couldn't tell me musically. Even though she's a very good musician, she wouldn't tell me musically. She would tell me more in descriptions and colors and how she wanted it to sound and, and the way she wanted it to sound. So I would create that mix based on what artists talk to me conceptually as. And I'm pretty good at receiving that and turning those into actual technical moves that uh, that make the song sound different than it did on the record. But the audience wants it to sound like the record. That's what they're used to hearing. Mm-hmm. So based on that as the benchmark to meet, um, that expectation as I said, owing only to artist conceptual change, would do I differ from that? Wow, that that's the magic. Because as I say, when she that can, is the magic. She yeah. can tell you in in her way, and then you can translate that. And for us, the audience, and you understand how to make that work. For, that's an amazing skill, man. Yeah, um, there's there. Well, the one example I can say is that with Lady Gaga, because she was very mu- musical, is that um, her song um, "Poker Face." Uh, she hangs on the root note, the, the tonic of that song throughout the verses, right? It's, it's, I basically, she hangs on one note. I'm gonna be like a bunch of right? There's not, there's not, there's not a lot of going on in there as far as a motif or anything where she's following a musical line. And that's what makes the, um, so it was to her, it was just sitting. And um, she said, oh, my God, Scotty, I want to do something really aggressive. Just be aggressive on this song. And I said, OK. So having multi-tracked her during rehearsal, uh, uh, Gaga and I were sitting at my desk. And I said, well, let's try this. And I put a distortion vocal. I, I put an amp simulator on her voice. And so it was distorted. And it was aggressive. And it was edgy. And, and it, so then it took on this distorted sound. Not overly distorted, but just enough to sound aggressive and agitating. And then, so when she, which makes that song, what I love about that song is then when she opens up into the chorus, carry my, carry, you know, that sort of, that's when I would take the distortion off and it would sort of float and it would be sky blue. And if you can listen to that song in your head, or when you do listen to Poker Face, you, it, it is a flight. She's very rooted and constituted and down and aggressive. And when the chorus, during the verses, when the chorus comes, she turns it over and she sort of floats through the chorus. And it's important as a technical person that's supporting that artistic endeavor, right, to understand where what she means and how she means it, and then to help her float, help her fly, because that's what we do, is we help people, not to be too self-important, but I take what I do seriously. Okay. And so it, it, and when I can inspire them by doing certain things, and as soon as I did that, and then as the chorus came, I turned it off of her, and she jumped up and grabbed me, and and was like shaking me, uh, hugging, kind of a violent hug shake thing. She was a very touchy person, and she was very aggressive about it. And she said, "That's it. You're a that's fuck. That's a fucking genius move. Oh my god, Scotty, that's it." So we that sort of carried through. Uh, all the time I worked with her was just was that inspiration and trying to keep artists inspired. Because again, remember, 
um, they, they do these songs every night, mm. you know, they, and, and they always want to work on their m- new music. So stuff that they've already done, it's not always interesting to keep it interesting. You have to keep it sound inspiring. Wow. Wow. And, and listen, I'm going to keep it a, a buck, buck old one. I, I, I am not to say I'm a Lady Gaga fan. I just honestly, I've never listened to it, but I respect who she is. Obviously I know who she is. And, uh, I just, I just be low key hating cause I'm stupid. But I respect <laughs> Lady Gaga, and just hearing you talk about it, I have to go listen to to this music because uh, right. yeah, for sure. All right, man, woo, Scott, you're already kind of blowing my head a little bit with these stories. This is great. Uh, so Sheila E, you work with her in the E band, E Train, and man, you said Eddie M was there, Eric Lee's, huh? it's an all star, all star band, man, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so, and then you you sort of low key mentioned that uh, I think after this point you wanted to get out of the game. Is that right? I I did. I I um I Seal came to okay, yes. Bunkers, and Seal wanted to, he came to Bunkers to hear Michael Bland play. He finished his show in Minneapolis and quickly ran over to catch the last set of Michael playing at Bunkers. And afterward, they were Seal and Michael were talking and. Uh, Michael motioned for me to come over and as I came over to them he said Michael said man I got to introduce you to my sound guy you know my my tech Scotty he's a sound guy he's a great sound engineer you got to meet him and and Seal introduced himself and curiously the very first thing he said to me was will you ever lie to me Hmm? and I said no not knowing where he was going and I was young anyway I, I just said no and he said okay well if I don't hear things on the front of house recording, are they in the mix? And I said, well, they, they might be if it's a small enough room, but generally no. If, they're, if it's a recording right off the board and they're not there, that means they weren't heard. And he said, okay, I need your phone number. And so the next morning, he called me from the Hyatt. I used to have caller ID in the, the caller ID box in those days. And I saw the Hyatt Regency come up and he said, Scotty, this is San Henry. And I said, who? And he said, uh, this is Henry. This is Seal. And I said, oh, hey, man. And he said, you got to come out on the road with me. So I think wow. it was the day after that I was on a plane to Dallas or New Orleans or somewhere down there. And and um, the way I was brought in on that tour offended some people because it was under the auspices of me being uh, Seal's friend. But really, in reality, what I was doing is sitting in the crowd and taking notes because mm. he knew he knew where it is from where I just came. I came from Prince and I came from Sheila E. And he wanted that sort of precision on the road. And so he it put me in a bad position when I did take over sound and offended some people. And I just pushed right through it and did what I was supposed to do, which is help make his show better. Mm. And after that experience, I thought, well, maybe this isn't for me. You know, there, there. I saw there were a lot of things out on the road that I didn't see, and that I wasn't constituted who I was as a person. So, politics um, of it, uh, politics, abuses of people, and mm-hmm. substance abuse, and things like that. So I just said, nah, this isn't really for me. So um, it was because of that I was, it wasn't doing it, and just going back to the Minneapolis scene for a few months, and then I got a call from a manager who. Uh, who said, do you know this kid Maxwell? This kid Maxwell mm. knows who you are and he's had me track you down and he wants you to mix him. And I had, I, I then recalled over a period of a day or so meeting this guy in a club in New York City and he had tracked me down because he loved the mix. And we had talked later and uh, as I've said before, he, the compliment he paid me was he said that um, he told his manager that he said, Scotty talked about Prince the way I want people to talk about me after they're done working for mm. me. Mm. And um, he had never heard anyone speak that highly of Prince. And I, I was obviously did the opposite of that. So, um, so he brought me back in. And I, when I would have been out, he, he sort of brought me back in. And that's where I stayed once I got back in. So I, I owe a lot to Maxwell. We had a very high level of, uh, of achievement on, that, on, that, on those tours, those three or four years that I worked with him and uh, that's where I met Dave Hampton. Okay. And, um, and, uh, so what year was this? Do you remember what year you started working with Maxwell? I think Maxwell was 90, it was 90, probably 95 or 90, 96. It was urban hang suite. So it's oh. right when he was really blowing up. So Ooh. till the kind of 
Pops come knocking and ascension yeah. and uh, something, something. I mean, all <laughs> oh, something, something. All those songs were just so beautiful to to mix live. And Maxwell cared about how it looked and how it sounded and how he looked. And he wanted um, he bu- he bought me my first you know eight hundred dollar suit. I mean, I <laughs> still to this day wouldn't own an eight hundred dollar suit. But he he said, you know, Scotty, you got to look good out front, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why you got his you voice down? <laughs> can't be looking all raggedy and shit, right? You gotta fucking fly, yo. Oh, so I'm gonna buy you a fucking Paul Smith. So he bought me a, he bought me a an eight hundred dollar suit with an iridescent inside. I mean, it was oh, great. Man. And um, and so because I, it, Maxwell, knowing that the in a, in a theater tour, the 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 front of house engineer and the lighting engineer are the two people that the crowd sees last when they come out. So he wanted that representation to be good all the way till when the crowd left. Very, nice. very, very aware gentleman. Nice. A very, very aware performer as well, to the highest degree. And his his benchmark was Prince. So he knew he right. he brought in a lot of people that had been around Prince. He brought in Robbie Pastor as his valet and personal assistant. He brought me in. He ended up having Prince people after that. He he knew what what uh, he was trying to do. He now, was very good. Um, very good to me. I, I love hearing this because as an outsider, as a fan, I was heavy into Maxwell at that time. I could see mm-hmm. it. You, you could tell. I was like, I can see he's been studying. You know, you can just in this whole presentation. So when you say even to the sound man is the last piece of the person they see out the door, he had to be yeah. suited and booted. I already know like he yeah. was so, you know, presentation and he, yeah, you, you said he cared. That's, that's brilliant, man. And And Maxwell, to me, that album was one of the, you know, I think that album had came out and then it would kind of sat there for just a little bit before it really started to, you know, to, to blow up. And this is sort of the same time, obviously, uh, D'Angelo had just kind of came out and stuff. Yes. So it was a whole new you know, wave of guys that was coming in, you know, they call it Neo Soul, whatever, but it was that whole new thing in, in you know, in, in, in soul black music. And you could see both of these guys as again, as a super hardcore fan of Prince and of soul music, I could see exactly like I said they both got to be hard Prince fans because I can you can hear it in their music, but you could see it in the show. And I want to jump around just a little bit to set this up. I had seen uh, D'Angelo on his first uh, tour uh, for Brown Sugar. He came. He was at the Showbox uh, in Seattle. Yeah. And uh, his album wasn't that big at the time, but I had had it and I had listened to it a little bit. And I was like, I just said, there's something about this cat. I have to go see this live, you know. Uh, and, you know, the thing was, I remember the Brown Sugar video. He had Rafael Sadiq in that video and I was a huge yes. fan of him. So I was like, OK, I got to right. go see it. So when I see that concert, man, I was like, this dude got to be a prince head because I was listening to the harmonies he had with the background vocals. And I want to say he had uh, Angie Stone. Uh, was yeah. there as well, and I'm listening. I'm and like, I might have, I might have mixed that tour. That's why I'm um, wondering. Yeah, because I was like, this shit is I, crazy. It was because uh, I didn't do Voodoo. I left before Voodoo, and was Brown was Brown Sugar tour before? I was 99. I think I was with him in 99. Yeah, so Brown I could have, I could have. I probably did mix that show, and that was uh, he was great. And yeah, you could definitely feel. And that's what happened to, as you say, the people call it neo soul, and people want to classify everything, right? When right. Really, it, it classifies itself. You don't need to classify anything. But he, um, but I think all of that, I might be wrong here, but um, there's sort of a brass ring that's still hanging out there that Luther Vandross left, mm, okay. right? And and so when solo black male performers, when Luther left us, there there was that ring hanging out there. And so you had Craig David jumping for it. Right. And you had uh, Terrence Trent Darby and Maxwell. And everyone sort of was sort of... At, at, trying to capture this, but they were bringing in their own influences, right? And Prince was among the highest influence of the, of that era. So, um, and it's gone all the way up to, to John Legend. And, mm-hmm. and um, it, so it's, it's, I don't know if anyone has actually captured that ring. I'd say the closest one is John Legend. He's, or maybe Drake. I mean, maybe Drake has the brass ring now, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but. Um, I can see a faint line to that. I can see what you see. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I mean it's now. Yeah, you know, I don't want to get into the conversation of wh- where's that. But yes, there's definitely that pedigree. You know, you'd, you'd have to throw. I would throw in like Curtis and and, and Smokey and, and that sort of thing too. You know, like there's that definitely that soul 
sort of thing. And it's very interesting, and we'll come back around to it, but then it sort of influences the guy who influences those guys, right? To me, when right, I think right. of, like, Rainbow Children, I could see, like, so, oh, okay, these are what the guys are doing now. Let me come back and show them. You know, let me do my version of, uh, yeah, that's of, right. of, of that. But um, So you, you, you're with, the, with Maxwell... And then uh, do you get with the D'Angelo thing after the Maxwell thing, or is that? Um, no, I did Maxwell first, um, 96 to 99, maybe maybe even 2000 I touched. I, I Somewhere in there I worked in D'Angelo, and then R. Kelly followed shortly after that. So that, w- that was right after 9-11 um, mm-hmm. when I was with R. Kelly. So that had a um, – that was a good – I think I worked with, with Rob for about a year and then I had Earth, Wind, and Fire was was wow. sprinkled in there as well. So I was sort of becoming known as the soulful white R and B engineer, right? <laughs> and it, it, it's true, it's true. And and even even Rob introduced me as Double O Soul to a bunch of I think it was a bunch of guys on the Dallas Cowboys football team. So I remember meeting Emmett Smith. And Deion Sanders, and we were all in a room together, and he said, "Man, you got to meet my sound guy, Double O Soul." He didn't even say Scotty. He just and so. Uh, I felt at that point I was started started to to, to risk becoming Ginger from Gilligan's Island, right? Mm. Like, you're, who says I'm Tina Louise? You know, it's, no, you're not. You're Ginger, like forever known as this character and this this one one thing you did for a few years. So mm-hmm. um, I wanted to branch out and change uh, what I was doing. And with Dave Hampton, who was a kind of a mentor and he's a colleague of mine, with Dave's help, I sort of crafted my way through, um, and not necessarily out of R and B. But I wanted to take on non R and B, meaning white acts, right? I wanted to show my diversity, mm-hmm. and so I didn't want to get pigeonholed as as that goes. So I said, "Well, let me take on different acts." And I think within a couple of years, no, not even that. I think it, the 2003 was a big year for me because I added Madonna. I added Dur- uh, uh, Duran Duran. Wow. Which so we're there already, Donny Osmond. Now we're fully there. Really, and then um, somebody else. I think uh, Brian Ferry or somebody like I added somebody. So I added a bunch of acts in two thousand three, two thousand four that were that were non R and B acts. So I sort of felt better, like I was remaining <laughs> wide to the industry, and I could do everything. I'd done everything basically except classical and country, right? So I was ready for anything. And you have to keep your chops ready as well for for right. for whatever comes. Our way too. Now, now I have to ask you because it's, it's a few of these names, you know, super icons. But Madonna, like, how does one get to work with Madonna? Obviously, your name rings out at this point. Um, but how was that? What was that experience? Because obviously, she has a very vast catalog of music and different types of sounds. You know, and, well, and she was dealing yeah. with it. She was doing doing a different type of sound on the American Life tour. She did a different type of sound altogether. So she had Stuart Price. Um, uh, was her producer on that record and he has a certain sound to his stuff so she was changing even the way we did the way she did Borderline and uh, Like a Virgin everything turned a different direction mm. so that was interesting for me I didn't have to mix it from a legacy point of view I could mix it from a new point of view and make it more electronic so it's, it all, it's all owing to what the artist wants to do again conceptually and following that vision that or, or oral vision of what they want to do I'm just curious because earlier you talked about, you know, what the fans want to hear, like the record and, and this sound and like the, the songs are presented in a different way. What, do you remember what sort of the perception of the audience was to hear these songs, in a sense, reimagined, I guess, in a different way? Um, no, and I don't, I did, with Madonna was probably the, the shortest stint and the least amount of contact with the crowd and the audience that I had. A lot of it was promo and a lot of it was um, a lot of TV shows. We did a whole bunch of TV shows in Europe. Mm. And um, and so there was less, we got on less of a, um, it, I think the way she operates is she gets it down in the beginning and it just stays like that. There's not a lot of genesis. The, 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 it, doesn't, it doesn't change over a, a period of time the way. The way other artists are willing to change things and let them organically kind of flow. This is a this is a thing that you're on. It's the same every night and it's locked in. There's not a lot of experimentation in room. And usually her production sizes were such that they were big enough where there wasn't room to grow them because you'd have to grow. You'd have to have all the department heads come in and help grow it a certain way anyway. Right. So, so the bigger a, the tour, the more locked in it is. Right. And this kind of like, you know. 
as I've noticed over the last few years, the shows sort of become as you you know they're more a production, almost like a stage show, or you know I mean like a it's this is the set way the show is, and you know they got to hit the cue over there, and the music's got to do this, and the lights got to match this. Is that more of sort of what you're talking about with this particular show, or what you? Well, doing? it is. It, it is, and it's it's become the norm now because there's just a quality control that we have to match. There's no, there's not as much money in live, or excuse me, in records anymore. Mm-hmm. So the music, the the way to get financial remuneration for your work and your time is through live uh, performance and merchandise. So you have to, it has to be a certain way live. It has to be your bad night can only be, you know, eighty five or ninety percent of the quality of the show. Like a bad night can't you have to protect so that it could never go lower than a certain amount mm-hmm. and that's what where tracks come in and that's where playback comes in and that's where um ghost lead vocals come in to to support an artist and all those things and i think what it's done is it's the protection of the quality of the show has taken uh fearlessness mm-hmm. out of the equation mm-hmm. artists don't know how to be fearless anymore um they don't know what it's like to really crash and Speaking of crashing and burning, I guess another good example would be in auto racing to, to jump tracks here, but it's on the same understanding. The safety gear in auto racing is so good now that you can take these massive impacts, right? Mm-hmm. And Did you see the one at uh, Indy the other day? It was crazy. And, wow. and, and people can just get out and throw their gloves and take their helmet off and walk away. And, you, and when years pass, that never, that never was. But the old-time racers know what it was like to feel an impact with, not, with, with shitty safety gear, right? So the new, younger racers, they're fearless. Or they don't need to be reverential to that because they're so protected. And that's kind of where it is with music. You know that, that uh, Taylor Swift, they're not going to allow her to have a bad night. They have, they have systems in place to just not allow that to happen. And so what that does, though, is it, it, it makes the crowd expect a certain thing, right? And, and that's what I miss. And that's the thing that Prince, you know, getting back to the, the basis of your podcast, is, is, is that Prince was always fearless. He never, he, he never had, he, he wasn't fearful of this or that. He was, he was always challenging the way things were done. And um, even though that, he paid a price there too because he was resistant to technology uh, hmm. in, in several ways that I can point out that would have led to a more creative um, uh, experience by him and for his fans. So he paid a price in that sense, but he was never fearless to, to go with things to fly off the, but because he could, he could, he could do anything at any time. Go, go deeper into and, that. I'm, uh, I'm curious. You, you kind of throw that out there, but wh- wh- how an example would he have been resistant to technology um, he didn't like digital desks. He didn't like digital consoles. I was the only one, I was the only engineer who during my time was successfully made a transformation to digital consoles. And, and subsequent to that, he trusted um, a friend of mine named Danny to mix him in, um, to mix Prince in Las Vegas on a digital console. Um, he didn't like them. He couldn't uh, navigate them. He didn't want to. He, 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 I think they scared him. And um, he, Prince wasn't willing to be bad at something. Right. He 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 only did things he was really at which he really excelled. So he's he's a smart person. He just didn't take on things that he could be uh, be looked at as not doing well. So he he stayed away from um, there's sort of a of a, a, a famous photo of, of Prince and me at my sound, my live sound console yes, yeah. that Afshin Shahidi. I have him to thank for that. And I have Prince for to thank for giving that photo to me. Um and where he's just sitting, and that, that's the closest he got was just leaning on my desk. He never touched anything just because once I went digital, um, it sort of scared him. But the precision that we could do digitally was was much greater for the show, and it was um, much greater for the uh, legacy basis of the material. Right? I could match all the delays perfectly. I could make all the sounds sound the way I'm making them now sound on, on the Revolution Tour. And... The precision was something, and playback is another good example. We had we had playback, and Prince was one of the first to use loops in it, live loops in his show. But all the loops, these these signature sound beats that that you hear, uh, drum beats that you hear, are, were only one or two bars long. I don't think we 
even with Michael, we had nothing was ever more than two bars long because it took two bars to mature. That, that drum loop was two bars long. And then it would just repeat and repeat and repeat. And Michael would stop it when he wanted. Now we have full playback engineers that their whole job is to lay the show out in the one timeline. And that the constraint of that and the constraint of an arrangement scared Prince. He did not want to be, he didn't want to be told by a machine what to do, even though he used machines supremely well, especially drum computers right. um, and drum machines. He used them. He made them work for him, right? He, they worked for him. There was never any, any question as to who was running that. But when machines run you and clicks run, he wanted me to, uh, even as recently as January of 2016, uh, before the piano show, he said, he said, Scotty, we're going to start having a lot of artists play here. So um, I want you to make a big sign um, to put it on the, you know, the symbol door, right? <laughs> on the back side of the symbol door in the NPG music club, he, he wanted me to make a sign that said, no click tracks, no playback. <laughs> <laughs> so any band, including the time, because they were going to come in and play, he wanted them to know we don't use click tracks in, right. in this building. We don't use playback. He wasn't. Uh, he was adamantly against that. Just to jump quickly on the we'll come back, he wasn't using it. So he wasn't using some sort of click track on the piano on a microphone stuff. Like, no, okay. not at all. But you're also talking about a man who had supreme time. Right. Okay. His, his time was probably second, second only to Michael Bland. You know, Michael Bland. We could call out. I could say to Michael, uh, 96 BPM, just horsing around during during rehearsal, and Michael would go, uh, "All right, man." <clears throat> And we would tap it out, and it would be 96 BPM every time. Wow. Wow. He's a, Michael's this. He's probably part Android, um, <laughs> but he Michael's really. Uh, 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 but but as far as time, and Prince used to talk about Michael and his time being just so. Uh, he's like a clock. He's like a machine, and but, but a machine with feel. And Prince had great time. Great time as a rhythm player, mm. and maybe even better time as a bass player. Just great. Was that? Yeah, I mean. When I think of Prince, obviously he comes from a different time, and 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 when he started playing, and just the guys that you would look up to, and being in a band all these years, and just just the rehearsing all the time, I could understand how. Yeah, you don't want to be constrained to the click track of a machine, or what if I want to just jump into this real quick? You know, I, I've always been curious um, how a musician of his pedigree. Versus maybe some of the newer people who may have come up through more digital recording techniques and things and mm. quantizing stuff and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, sort of, again, that, to me, it ties into what you talked about, the show aspect of today, where it's like, yeah, you're not going to have a bad show because, you know, this all, we pretty much laid this show out and just hit play and follow along. But I wonder, though, what is that, and you, and you brought to the point, what does that do, though, for... Mm. the spontaneity of the show and, what and not only that to, but the feel yeah the, the feel and what if they want to too. jump into this and go a little faster here and you know and react to the audience and stuff I, I, sometimes it seems like we miss that sort of feel and i'm going to bring one guy up real quick because i really respect this dude but i've seen some concert footage uh bruno mars like i'm a, yes i'm a big fan of his stuff his new stuff and i saw one of his shows recently or just bits and pieces of it and I was curious because I know he has a band and stuff, but I can tell that they're probably sort of doing the method that you talked about where, you know, there's these time going on and stuff. And I was kind of wondering how is he going to play these new songs? Because to me, they would be great just to let the band do their thing. But I could kind of tell like they're probably it's restrained within this sort of boundary of you're not going to go too far away with it because, you know, the next thing has got to come into it. And I think that we're missing something with shows and I would imagine, you can tell me if I'm wrong, like I don't think Maxwell would have had that during that hang suite and maybe the tour after that. I know damn for sure D'Angelo didn't have that stuff going no, on. No, D'Angelo didn't have that stuff going on. Maxwell did. But oh, we did. had click tracks on everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, <clears throat> and he, talk about 96 BPM. I think I remember the 60% of the songs were 95 or 96 BPM because they fell into this kind of sexy. Right laid back sexy thing you can't do sexy's hard at 110 <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> so there's a certain and and even when programming a, a tour and i always make for every artist i make a, a google doc or something that has every key their song is in every beats per minute or that they are who plays what instrument what microphone 
the lead singers on, wow. what guitar the guitar players. And what it does, you start to look at it and go, oh, we're building a trend here. We're in A major there. We're in C sharp minor there. Let's switch those around. And it sort of helps the flow of the show by being able to look at all the information. And is it too informationalized? Yeah, it's sometimes that's a little bit too thinking through it a little bit too much. But um, <clears throat> if there are moments in a show that people can go off, then then they're there. In the Revolution show, there are several moments that they just let loose currently. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I have a little pushback about that. But again, I, I'm just from a, a, a fan's perspective. And I've just grown up watching all these older acts play so it's just interesting to me when i see the newer stuff i can kind of tell you can tell the difference and just as yeah. you say the feel it's just, it's just something the fierceness i always because it, when i look at like them prince performances like when he'd be on the grammys or just whatever and i'm like you know what's was missing with those and was missing today because he didn't give a. I'm not, excuse my language. They didn't give a fuck. Like they was they was doing it for real and it was going in like that's just the shit that they did try and put george he, try and put george clinton on a click yeah exactly that'll go over well yeah yeah bootsy or something <laughs> let my right. you know, let them feel that you know what i'm saying but uh I, but i get it you know these are massive productions nowadays and as you said yeah the, it's, it's a, quality control quality it's, control it's, finance it's quality control <clears throat> yeah you know so I, I it's run by a whole different sect of people they're they're business people and they know that that's where a lot of money is coming in it's not just to support t-shirt sales right this is a whole different business now and the industry is Everything's predicated upon how much you can make in the live game as far as I'm concerned. Because nobody makes money on streaming. The streaming fees aren't that high. And yeah, um, no. it's still a bunch of people that are programmers that are making 30% off, off artist money. That's a whole other discussion. But, right. um, but, yeah. it's, but it's not, it's, it's, uh, that's why I think when you can still, and, and now the prince is gone, we can say all, he never gave in. He still did it right. his way live all the way till the end. And um, even on piano and a microphone it was done very organically it was four or five inputs on the desk and um as it should be that was a, a fitting way for for him to leave us was um in a true organic uh wow. in a truly organic way listen because i have to follow the flow of how things are going so we're going to come back to the other stuff but we, since we're talking about piano and a mic and now I had the opportunity to go to that gala uh, event thing, you know, at Paisley Park in January. It's at the 21st, uh, right. where, they, where they debuted that whole thing. Talk to me a little bit. Now, you, you did the sound for that uh, yes. night, and that was the debut of this show. What was, the, what was it like to set up for that, and, and from your perspective? Um, it was a little bit frustrating, but it was ultimately, I knew, um, even though I fought Prince on what he was doing, I, I ultimately had to give into it. It was frustrating because he wanted to do quad sound. He loved sound in all four corners. And unfortunately that only works for really one great place in the room, which is the center. And, um, because it's simply the physics of it is that <clears throat> the sound is arriving at different times from different speakers if it's loud enough. So it gets very confusing. And um, so I tried to push for us doing a, a single source sound around the stage and outward. And, and uh, I think we came up with a balance and, and uh, it wasn't too hard. Uh, it, was, it wasn't as hard as I thought to come up with a satisfactory uh, setup for him. He wanted it. Um, mixed in quad and I gave it to him and I just had to really push for those levels underneath and around the stage to be higher than the ones coming from the four corners and once we we found that on January 20th it was just Prince and I did it alone uh, over the course of a few hours where we he played some stuff and then we balanced it out and I would turn it up he'd say turn this up there and now turn my voice up over there and <clears throat> he was again he was treating the whole room as his monitor right and and uh, I'm a little more reverential to the people who are sitting in that back corner and how they're going to hear it. So I, I had my point of view, and I was never afraid to so sort of push that point of view. I didn't give in um, like other engineers had done over the years for him. So I sort of fought for it, and then we sort of found this balance. And as soon as – and I knew all his tells. And as soon as he just started playing and, and didn't say anything anymore and he just kept playing and playing, then I knew we were there. So I was saving all these settings as we went. And then when he said – uh, he turned, and, and this is the night before the show, he turned and said, 
um, uh, all right, now do you have time to go over the set list? And I said, sure. And um, he said, why don't you come up and, and bring a stool? And um, instead of going up on the riser that I built for him, <clears throat> knowing that that uh, the psychology of how Prince worked, knowing that there was a um, a height and a distance thing with, with Prince, I opted to stand. I said, no, I'm cool right here. And I just... It was a four foot high riser, so I just opened my three ring binder on that riser for him to. So I was behind him and to his right, and he would play a little bit, and then he would turn and say, "Right there, can you do this?" and and do you have an effect for the beginning of the show? We're gonna have the doors open, and we talked through it. We talked through the whole set. It took about three hours <clears throat> to talk wow. through the whole thing, and we were the only ones there. And he said, "I want. Can you get me a light behind the the uh, doors?" I said, "Sure." And so I knew I knew right away. Okay, I can go get this light. And you had to do it all, right? So I said, "All right, I'll I'll wow. get we'll get this light, and we'll do that, and we'll bring both smoke machines right here." And I think I ran, yeah, I ran one of the smoke machines for the show to start. Uh, there were two smoke machines, and another engineer ran it. So we, we you kind of, I'm having to think of all this and take notes as I'm reading him and what he wants to do, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to think who's going to cover that, who's going to do this, right? So um, that show I mixed from behind the curtain just to the, if, if you're looking at the symbol door, I was to the right behind him, behind his back. I, and as I say, I was a little bit too smart to go on the other side where he could look up and look across at me, hmm. right? I didn't want to be within his his view because it's it's um, it could distract and distort his thought. He doesn't want to see technical people in his in his vision because he wants it to be a truly artistic experience. So I'm being reverential to that. I would, I stayed back behind him and he always knew I was behind him um, and, and ready to, to do what I needed to do. So for the sound, so, and I didn't need to be in the middle of the room for this. It's a piano and a voice and I knew all the effects and we had talked over what effects, as a matter of fact, the opening effect, do you remember that descending echo that sort of bounced around the room? A little bit, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Um, I think he's, I don't know whether he came out and said Paisley or whatever he said, but it went blaze, 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 blaze. and it kind of descended and went down in whole steps. And, uh, that was a, an effect that I had written back in 2000, uh, 2004, I think we did it on musicology. And, um, and so when he asked me for an effect, he said, you have an effect to open the show? And I said, sure, try this one. And he went, check one, two. And I said, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Try it now. And he went, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. And, and then he turned and nodded, gave that sort of little nod, like, yeah, that's good. And then he played with it. He, did a, he said a few things and let him, let him echo into this harmonized, low, uh, kind of a 1999 voice. And then he just played with it a bit. And then he said, okay, after that, I'm gonna, when, as soon as I start the Batman theme, then you turn that effect off. And we worked out a timeline of the, and we, he basically played the whole set, portions of every song in the whole set. There were maybe 23 songs. And... And I said, okay, do you want the uh, something in the water does not compute, right? Do you want that little echo? And he said, yeah, just do your thing on there. And I said, okay. So I, some of the things I tried to, to Purple Rain, I put the echo on Purple Rain. I put the, the right effects on the right thing, knowing that it was going to become a record. And it has. I mean, the, it's already been mixed. I don't know whether they used my mix or the one that John Gass mixed because I multi-tracked that show. But um, – uh, so, that, so you said you guys knew this was going to be a record before you actually even did the show. Like that was oh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. I mean, everything was assumed that it was going to be a record all the time. I had to operate anytime I mixed prints. I was assuming that it was going to be released. And in the old days, that was by the NPG Music Club, where he would put, I think it was called, uh, what's the one where it's all the sound checks? Uh, no, it's C Note. Oh, yeah. There's, he's got C Note. So C Note are all these. Um, uh, sound checks from Japan, and um, and, and uh, so everything we did, we had he I had to consider that it was going to be released at some point. Okay. And now, boy, isn't that true now, right? Because right. I have, I think I have maybe three hundred plus dats that I recorded that are in the vault as we speak. So um, I have to get in preparation for that wow. and getting credit for all that. So I have to write letters and and make sure people. Yes, sir. Scotty, are they still doing support for DAT technology? Um, you can, you can, you can take things off of DAT still, of course. So, um, and there are still DAT. There were still at the time of his death DAT uh, recorders in uh, and players in each studio. Um, and every major record company has every different technology you can imagine. <laughs> Be it eight tracks, cassettes, <laughs> mini disc, DAT, reel to reel in every form. Um, they are. All in archival, uh, and they are 
ready to put on any artist's music. So if the Doors recorded something and they recorded it on, you know, 16 track Tascam, just some strange wow. machine, they've got a version of it. And, wow. and they, so they can always pull. And a lot of what they're doing now is they, of course, they, they're, they're recording it into high resolution audio for, for archival purpose. And I wouldn't be, no, I guess I would be surprised if they'd done that already at Paisley Park. This, the volume itself is so much to do. But if they were smart, they'd be, they'd be cataloging all of that. <clears throat> whoever, whoever's got the, who's, whoever that's in the, uh, in charge of that would be doing that now would be, would be saving that stuff. Um, hmm. Although if you asked, I, I don't know, he, who knows whether Prince would even care, you know, if that stuff ever came out. It's hard, it's so hard to say. People postulate all these theories about what, um, about what he would want, right? That's a tricky, tricky thing to get into. Mm -hmm. What he would want. Oh, he would want this. Well, no, he wouldn't. Because I know damn well that if he came back, the first two words he'd say is everybody out. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. You'd have all these people from Graceland there just go. <laughs> and the door shutting behind him. They would, that's just how he would just, everyone would be out. He would, everyone would have to leave. Everyone. He'd be alone in there and he'd have to reacquaint himself with the building and how it looked. And that, but does he care about the, you know, he, he always told me that he, he told me in 2012 that he, that the best stuff that he did during, during the Purple Rain era, he didn't give to Warner Brothers. Hmm. And, he, and he pointed down, the, he was sitting at the head of the table in the conference room, and he pointed down in the direction of the ball. He said, the best stuff I recorded during the Purple Rain era is down there. Wow. So that's tantalizing to fans, right? Right. Oh, and, whether, yeah. and whether or not he's talking about moonbeam levels or electric, inter, you know, it, 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 you know, that, that remains to be judged by people whether or not they think that stuff's better but um, um it, it's i'm not sure how much he cared about what was in there afterward and what would be done with it um but it is important it's important culturally and we are a civilization that for sure we we like artistry so that stuff all has to be documented the way it would be for stevie wonder or right or, right. or donna you know you have to you have to support artists tell us who we are and they tell us I think uh, I think it was a Picasso that said, "Art is a lie that tells us the truth." Right? Hmm. So we 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 live through our art and we express ourselves through art and and then we it really tells us who we are as people. Not to get too wow, no, I just no, went no. there. Sorry. I wanted to ask you this question now that you mentioned uh, the different recordings and stuff, and uh, I will play if, if it's okay with you. I'll play the the, the sample you sent me uh, from that show where he mentions your name during the show. Does it sound good? <laughs> the reason is Scotty. His name is Scotty. Show him love. But being that you uh, said you have all these dads, and you're uh, a sound person, you you know, in this field, and you can answer this how you want. But I'm curious, what are your thoughts on this deliverance situation uh, that happened uh, being as a, a sound guy or somebody who worked with Prince as in a trusted capacity with him? If you can comment on that, I'm curious, what did you think of that whole situation? I pro probably, I probably shouldn't. I w but I always tell the truth, so and I speak my mind. So I, I don't, I don't know how, whether it was appropriate or not, and I don't know the particulars and the details about what um, Ian's uh, arrangement was with Prince. Who knows? No one knows. Right. Uh, m m maybe Ian knows, um, but uh, um, it's, it's it's art. It's to be brought out. You could say that. You could say the same thing about a. a uh, any photographer who uh, publishes pictures of prints, are they doing the same thing? Was that picture, was that image and likeness okayed? Nobody seems to have any trouble with, with a photograph, right? Mm -hmm. So why would they have trouble with, with songs and getting out? But um, it's a, just a really touchy s subject right now because the sheer volume and the, can't, the, the, the amount of work this man generated and material that he generated that people don't even know about, that, um, that what do you do with it? And who gets to release it and who gets to benefit from it? Mm -hmm. And it still all remains to be seen. It's, I guess it's going to go to the highest bidder. But uh, um, there are people that are out there that care about how it's presented and how the historians will, will uh, you know, how it will be put together as a package so that in 100 years when no one's around that 
lived during this era, um, how will it be viewed then? And how will his work, what kind of lasting legacy will it have? I, I, I tend to think that personally, I, I, I think um, it's unimportant uh, how much we think we, how much we know and how much we think we know. It, that's why I love being in live sound. Um, being a part of the studio sound, you, you can, you have many, many chances of getting it right. You can go back and curve performances. You can, you can, you can um, do retakes and you can mix things together. And it's um, you, the spontaneity is gone. But live only happens once, and you can fix it later. But I, I prefer to let things happen as they happen. And then, I mean, if you think about it, Beethoven never had anything recorded his <clears throat> in his era. Mozart, Brahms. Schubert, Schumann, they never had anything and they didn't reap the benefit of that as well. So just because we have it recorded doesn't, I don't know, it gets into this really sticky thing. But Ian, um, Ian was a trusted, very trusted engineer by Prince. I know that. Um, he's got great ears and good instincts. And I think, and I don't even think the whole story is being told. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot more to it involving other people um, that that are probably putting him in an unfair position. Uh, position right now and it'll be interesting to see to watch how that goes right because it's not like i'm sitting on anything that i have that i could release it's um all my stuff was because it happened at a show it was turned in right at the end of the show i was very careful to protect myself and hmm. turn over all materials as soon as the show was over as a matter of fact i made i made on on just about nearly every show i did not the after shows i had to chase him down to <laughs> to put him in his hand after an after show. So he couldn't get away and head to the hotel before I gave him the dats at, at after shows because I knew that holding on to them even for a night would put me in a bad position. He, I held on to one dat one night where he screamed out of there in New York at an after show. And, um, and I couldn't get, get it to him and I didn't know where he was staying. So the next day at soundcheck, I walked up and gave it to him and said, hey, this has been with me the whole time. And he said, yeah, right. <laughs> and I said, no. And he said, how many copies have you made? And I said, <laughs> I said none, man. I... And so I walked away, and then later um, Zachary came over and said, well, now he wants you to write a letter Whoa. saying that you didn't make any copies. Right? Yeah. So I took that as a, I, I took offense to that. So I wrote him the most absurd letter that said, I, Scotty Pakulski of Sound Mind and Body, do hereby solemnly swear... <laughs> That you know, and I, 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 I was ridiculous about it, and that I did not, that it was in my possession the whole time, and that it was, and, and signed it and gave it to him as sort of my, I was a little bit incensed by that because, people who are who are engineering for him, and whether it be live or or, um, uh, in the studio, we have to have his best interest in mind, and if we have a, if we have any, thought about it, we a forethought about it, we have to know that we're we're helping protect him, from what can happen now clearly. Um, either either he leaked stuff in his own career or other people leaked things. But things were leaked. So it's only one of two things happened. He leaked it or other people leaked it. And so whether it was intentional or, or someone else took credit for that, that's really that's really a sensitive issue with artists. That's, those are their creations. And uh, when you're talking about that man, you've got a lot of really powerful things that have, that have been um, recorded in his career and you want to treat them with reverence. And, and you, you know, open a, again, I'm just asking a question, uh, you know, because you are in this field, you've worked with this man, and you, you kind of brought this up. And, and to be clear, I'm not making no uh, accusations or anything, even with the deliverance thing. But I'm just curious because I have somebody who, uh, you, you know, you've worked with them in this capacity. But I'm curious, like in terms of like these live shows that we hear uh, of the soundboard recording, you know, the soundboard recording from, you know, 1980 da, 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 or, or whatever. Like how, in your opinion, how do these things get out there? I'm always, I was always like, how, how did those come out? You know, there's a uh, one of the classic, you know, bootlegs uh, from the Love Sexy tour that after show in uh, small club, sec, you know, whatever they call it, small club. Yeah, small club, a, second a show. Masterful <laughs> performance, right? And I always, I always be like, man, if I was Prince, I just put this shit out myself. God damn, this right. is it's, it's incredible. But obviously. It isn't shot. It is not coming from an audience member, you know. It's coming from the board. So I'm just curious, in your opinion, how, how do these things happen? That's a good question. It's it's either, well, again, it, it's just simple math. It 
it's either prints, it's either artists release them themselves, in in so that they can generate some sort of, you know, buzz about it. Um, it's other people leaking them because they have access to the material um, with his approval, or or there are other people leaking them because they, they have access to the material without permission. So it's a simple equation it's one of those three things and um in those days i can say it was not difficult for me to go into the vault when i was a drum tech at paisley bark Hmm. it was if i needed something i would grab steve i would grab one of the engineers say hey i need to pull some tracks and we go down in the vault and and look oh there it is and pull it pull out sign of the times or pull out love sexy and grab certain drum sounds wow that wasn't hard we'd spool it up in c or in b and 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 listen to push up each fader and grab the drum sounds we needed. Um, you you would load up the actual two inch tape. Yeah, the actual wow. Uh, master. Wow, yeah. that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> and um, uh, so it it wasn't hard back then because we didn't we were in the middle of that era, right? So it wasn't look back. It's a different eyes that we're looking at it right now. Um, and um, and we needed those sounds. <clears throat> so short of taking his actual Lin LM one drum computer which i had access to all the time back then it would bounce around between different studios it'd go from b to a and when dave hampton built c uh, when he rebuilt studio c in 2000 maybe 2004 i believe he did um he used dave used me to test out that studio so i went in there and there was the lin was there and the moving soundboard the articulated soundboard that can move around the room and the bass and a guitar and all these things were plugged in and They've had all these custom simple knobs to use that would make it really easy for one person who didn't know much to record. And and I sat and programmed some beats on the Lin. And if I was smart, I would have gone, hey, I've got the Lin right here. Let me sample all the Lin in every different tuning. Mm-hmm. right? Because I needed that this year for the revolution. And I had to go source out um, how to get different tunings of the Lin drum machine so that I had all those signature drum sounds and they weren't just slowed down versions of a sample but I actually needed them sampled at that slower sound at a lower sound mm. so um at a tuned sound and I had to get a hold of that and I did and um and so again uh hindsight's 2020 and um uh it, we were just in the middle of that process and we were always busy and always chugging along so it, but getting back to your question I don't know how it leaks uh particularly I've never leaked anything myself and it's uh, it's difficult to imagine. Um, it's unconscious. It, it would take a real. Um, it would take somebody of to to give away someone's hard work for nothing. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Right. We have to be. We're in a position as engineers. We're in a position to protect someone's work mm-hmm. and not to give it out. But it depends on what the agreement was. If there was an agreement, if if uh, Prince and I had an agreement that. And he said, well, this is yours. When I'm gone, you can do this. Then if you don't have it in writing, you just have to go on good faith. So I don't know what the agreement was. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out, though, because a lot of that's going to have to be hashed out because of the right. amount of material he has. Yeah, it, and it almost seemed like after a certain period of time, those type of shows stopped. Like you, the soundboards, they wouldn't come in, in the later years like that. You know, Maybe after 2000 or something, you didn't really see... <laughs> It was like, hey, ain't been no soundboards of that show or these tours. And I would imagine at this point, things become more locked down. And we realize, hey, we're in a digital world. Who, who got access to the tape? Oh, okay, yeah. Right. We just sign off on that, blah, blah, blah. Right. And they were, and then you're talking about true copies of, uh, digital copies of stuff that is, you know, because digital, it's just, it's as good as it was, you know, 10 generations ago. Right. And that's very unlike tape. And so a lot of this stuff that different engineers live engineers before me the stuff in the vault unless they multi-tracked it and remixed it the actual two mix that came out of the speakers and the one that i recorded those those in those previous eras they're unusable a lot of them are unusable they have to just be taken at the state they're in and that's okay too because ultimately it's not about the 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 quality of the recording even though we say it is it's sly in the family stone right. when you listen to to some of that stuff, there's no low end on it because they simply couldn't put that much low end on a record, on an actual uh, vinyl piece of vinyl, because it just couldn't. It it, it wasn't good for the uh, the needle to, to to take that, and so they just didn't have a ton of low end. But you can hear the funk, you can still still hear the feel and hear the funk, mm-hmm. even though there's not a ton of low end. So to me, it's never about the quality; it's all about what's on the magic that's on there. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm glad you say that because there's a lot of songs that are sort of leak out and they have horrible sound quality, but the song's fantastic. It's like mm -hmm. it almost sort of associate oh, yeah. that quality with the song now. It's like I don't really want to hear yeah, it. That's yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and, and in recreating the loops for the revolution, we I know we're gonna get into this, but um I had to because nobody has access to the vault and I wouldn't want it anyway. There's no need for me. I can just when we're doc talking about digital samples, I can re redo everything from from good Lin drum samples. Um, I recreated all the loops for the revolution this year and um, I had to recreate it. You could have the recordings of the, of what Prince and Susan Rogers did. You could have the, the monophonic tracks of what they did, but it's the magic really that they did on the board that wasn't printed. Mm -hmm. So in other words, Susan was, would add an effect or would do something to it or Prince would turn on a phase, a phase pedal a boss phas phaser pedal, a flanger pedal rather, and it and the, the 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 sounds would go through it, and then they were recorded. It doesn't mean they were printed that way. It just means it was on during the time they bounced the, and uh, mixed the master track. So okay. he worked at such a pace that a lot of those effects on the Lin machine, and his guitar and his voice were never printed. They were just done on the desk. So after every session, that would be reset, and so that would be gone. That wouldn't be printed. So I had to redo all of this from the standpoint of making it technically accurate um, to what it was on the record. You just said something very interesting. I want to make sure the listeners understand, if I understand what you said. So let's say I pulled up, right, if I had a two-inch tape to, uh, I don't know, uh, if I was your girlfriend, and I loaded that up into the machine, right, uh, are you saying, like, a lot of the effects and things that we hear on the finished record are not actually recorded on that two-inch tape? They were done when they were mixing it down? I would assume that if you ask Susan, and, and I can ask her, um, that a lot of that stuff probably wasn't printed because they worked at, at Prince and Susan Rogers worked at such a fast pace on doing all that and getting mixes. And, you know, on a, on a, in a one day period, he would write or certainly he would, he, he could, but he probably came into a, a session with a song. He would record it, mix it and bounce it. Uh, and do a final mix of it in one, in that day. So I am, my, I would have high confidence that a lot of those effects. So if I, if I was your girlfriend, <laughs> all that stuff, right? And and how laid back and sexy that sounds. I bet you it went through probably a very very low cost, you know, Yamaha SPX ninety two or something, and and it was just an echo, or it went through his guitar pedal. And he just put the right echo on it to where he liked it. And then he said, he just left it on. And then they mixed it like that. So wow. a, I would imagine that a lot of that stuff was unprinted. Because you didn't have the tracks back then to keep bouncing stuff over and, mm -hmm. and mixing it. You just left stuff on. So that's very interesting. So would that be the difference again? I just want to, you know, I'm dumbing it down from my own understanding. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to the audience. So if they were to say, put out something and they said, the difference between them saying this is remastered versus a, a, a remix or, you know, because a lot of times, sometimes we like to think that, oh, they're loading up the actual master tapes and then they're going to do a whole new mix, which if I'm understanding what you're saying, you really couldn't do that. It's not going to sound anything, almost no. anything like what you are used to hearing because you ain't got those tools at their disposal to make it sound. They ain't going to pull Prince from the grave and get Susan in there. So is, no. is that the difference? Is that something? The, the most you could do, do is get the people that were there that cut the material to give their best guest, uh, owing to their memory, what would have been done. Mm. Not what he would have done, but what they would do. So you'd have to ask Susan. You'd have to ask Lisa. You'd have to ask Wendy. You'd have to ask Bobby mm. about what he would do. Bobby and I, Bobby Z and I had a discussion last month on the, on the road of all sorts of things about how he drum because I love the way Bobby drums and the way he um, he drums like Prince but he drums his own style but also but he's he's in, in, he's he's hugging the the Prince style himself he takes that into who he is and makes it part of how he drums it's really interesting and he said the Prince would do all sorts of really interesting things and hit cymbals on the three he said who who hit cymbals on a three you know but Prince did that because it was it was the right thing and he didn't. Uh, um, it, he didn't adhere to those rules. And I think because he didn't read music or he couldn't read charts, he couldn't play charts. Um, he, 
it was it was largely a feel thing. And I asked again. I asked Prince once. Uh, um, he asked me if I read music, and I said no. I said I used to when I played coronet in school as a kid, kid, but not anymore. And I said, do you? And he said, this is in 2012. Um, he said um, he said no. And I said, well, do you ever think of learning? It's not too late to learn. And he said. No, if I learn now, it would change the way I write. Mm-hmm. And I influence too many people with the way I write right now. And that's very true. Wow, he said I it influence would too many people by the way that I write. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. Yep. That's true. true statement. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know, and, and he would be learning rules that he that didn't exist in his mind before. So it would change the way he went, oh, I actually can't put a six on top of that. So that really doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And when it did work, I mean, who who did more cool inversions and and modifications than Prince? I mean, he did some fantastic stuff. Wow, really heart wrenching stuff. There are only twelve notes. People forget that there are only many many octaves. You know, eight eight or ten, however many octaves there are of twelve notes repeated. And to be able to find and pull these heartstrings with just an inversion, or dropping a six in or a flat five or something that. You don't have to know about music to know what I'm talking about. It's just when you listen to um, Sometimes It Snows in April, and um, I forgot what note it is there. Is that a five that he put? Sometimes, uh, hmm, right? The line, hmm, hmm. Ooh, that just that just that note makes you go, oh, it just kind of crushes you. It's so emotionally, in, it, 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 it's so evocative of emotion. And very few artists can do that like he can. And he could do it at will. And that's what was beautiful about piano and microphone is you, you got, I got to sit behind him for a couple of months of doing that and just listening to all these notes really clearly be dropped in wow. um, with, without being obfuscated or, or um, smeared by other instruments. How did, that, uh, how did those shows uh, change or grow over the time that you guys did those? Or did it? I don't. Um, that's a good question. Let me think about that. I, I would say it, it's not like I noticed that he got better o- on the keys over time. I think he improved. He improved his um, his movement from his interstitial uh, movement from one song to the next. I think he st- he kept refining that until the end, where he would go, "Okay, I'm going to actually do this one here because that works better." Mm. And he never had a a a, um, a tr- he had never had trouble going from like, wow, I'm in F sharp minor right now and I have to get to E major. Like, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, that's, I'm modulating downward and into a different, uh, he, he didn't have trouble with that because he, he knew how much time he needed to play chords around getting down into a certain key. He was really good at that. Um, he didn't see those kind of problems. They didn't exist for him. But I, I, it, it certainly did one thing. It reaffirmed for me that his greatest instrument was keys. Interesting. And that that I didn't, I didn't know. I wouldn't have written that in stone until after that tour, and, he, and but before his death. So during the middle of that tour, at some point, we were in Australia, and I said, "Wow, th- that's his instrument." Because number one, it's multitonal, so that takes drum programming and bass out of the mix. Um, not that you can't be um, multitemporal with a with a bass, but you understand. The gu- guitar was a great instrument of his, but a lot of that was. Um, uh, and he was such a great rhythm player as well. Mm. Um, but keys was to me his his real instrument and vo- and voice keys and voice. But if you take voice out of it, because everyone has such a uniquely different take on what they do, it, it affirmed uh, for me that the keyboards was his real. Um, that was his instrument. Wow. He could speak more through keys than he could any other instrument. Now, and people may disagree with that, but I just think from an evocative standpoint of pulling emotion out of out of people i think he could do it more on keys than any other instrument um so you know it, it, we mentioned it earlier and i promised ladies and gentlemen we were going to go back and cause we're going to talk about revolution we're gonna talk about one night alone my goodness but piano and microphone uh australia the outback yes. uh, you, you mentioned i don't know if this was before we started the show but you, this was so to your last times working with Prince during yes. this period, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was, um, uh, we did, we did, I was happy to, I think I started in the beginning of November of 2015. I got a call to come out there. He wanted to talk to me and start showing up there again and start 
go back on the payroll and start to work again. And we did a show with the NPG in um, in um, St. Bart's, a, a a New Year's Eve show in St. Bart's, a private uh, show. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That um, surprisingly, not a lot of people know about that show, but it happened in St. Bart's at a club, and um, uh, that was the last time I think the full proper NPG band played together. It was Donna and Kirk and. Mm. Ida and Adrian and um, uh, I'm missing some people. Liv was there, so um, that that was um, Cassie was on keys. So it it that was a, a true NPG show. And then he quickly wanted to get away from that, and he wanted to get on with this piano thing. So we um, again that January uh, event. I'm glad you were a part of that, and in the room and in the space to explore that and and experience that. Um, I'm sure it's something you'll never forget. Oh, and, amazing. um, yeah. and for me to get a shout out during that show really, um, and actually, actually, as it happened, I was looking down, um, I was sitting in my chair next to the sound desk and I wasn't looking at him all the time. I didn't need to, I wasn't taking visual cues from him on that show. Um, but I remember I was kind of looking down and we had put in a lot of hours and the, and the days leading up to that. So when he said, um, what he said about, you know, give it up for Scotty or show him love. I remember kind of looking up and going, oh, hey, and just kind of, <laughs> not, kind, of, kind of nodding my head. It was funny. I remember that now. I wouldn't have remembered it had it not meant something now, but I just kind of went, no, oh, yeah, thanks. And, and, uh, but it turns out that that was really nice that I was able to get, go through all those years and then come back and get a thank you in those last few months. But um, he, then he wanted to take it on the road. And against advice from a few people, they said, listen, this was lightning in a bottle. This was sort of, these, these shows were, were, you know, um, but he said, "No, let's let's take it out." And so we went to Australia, and um, and so that was he was really working on the show the, the whole time in Australia. He he started with a different kind of set list. They were short, if I remember. The first show was really short, like eighty minutes, um, seventy or eighty minutes maybe. And it just seemed like, whoa, they're over. You know, that first show was over. And then we do a second show; it'd be a little longer. And he might play Purple Rain or whatever. I'm not sure, but he would change it up a little bit. And I would get the set list. Man, I, I mean, five, eight minutes before they were usually, he was usually waiting on me because I had I would get the set list and then I would have to have um, somebody in the promoter's office and production office um, print it white writing on black background, right? I, I never wanted you to be able to see a big white set list on there with hmm. black writing, so I printed it in a negative way and then made one copy for myself, one for him, and and walk out, tape it on the set it on the piano, and then I'd go to my spot. And then I, I would radio, yeah, I'm ready, let's do it. So um, he, he was kind of feeling his way through and changing the show and adding things as we went. And then I left. Um, it wasn't the greatest situation for me. I guess I, I can put it that it was, um, I'm sure he was under a lot of pressure or putting himself under a lot of pressure. Something wasn't quite right. And and I'd never, in all the years I worked with him, I think that was the third time that I left of my own accord where I just sort of said, all right, well, let me just go back to what I was doing or move on. And it was certainly nothing that I knew uh, in retrospect, but it was what I knew for myself that just things just didn't didn't feel right. I just didn't feel like being there. And I remember telling him that I wasn't having fun, and uh, which was met with just a blank look. And so um, it was so at the last show, I think it was Auckland, right? I think I was in Auckland. Then I left. I headed back for the U.S. Um, he headed to Perth to do that show. So, so from Perth on Perth, Oakland, um, all those shows that followed up to Atlanta, I wasn't a part of, um, we, we were in contact by email, but I wasn't a part of those shows. And, um, and then now in retrospect, I think it was probably either a very good or a very bad decision that I left, but, um, it is what it is. And, um, and it wasn't the first time for me. So I just sort of decided it was time and, and left. It wasn't anything he did or anything I did. And so I was just trying to understand where he was, but it was a quite a vastly different experience, I'll say, um, from the loving kind of thing that was going on in January. So I just decided it was my time to take off again. Thinking, quite frankly, that I that I would just, in a few months, I'd get a call and say, hey, we, we got a show. Can you do this show? Because that's sort of how it always worked. You could have an argument and he would be either be reasonable about, about something or unreasonable, and then it would sort of just be resolved. And it was as if it had never taken place. And um, that was quite common. So I didn't think any big thing of it as it occurred. But then when I got that call, um, then I understood that it was quite different. 
Uh, I'm just curious. So when you leave, I mean, is there somebody else that does your job or how did how does that get handled? Um, what I did was I, I set it up with the promoter to have two engineers on standby in Perth. Oh. <clears throat> so I said, listen, it's, I have to leave. This is unsustainable for me. Uh, and so um, rather than getting asked to leave, which probably would have come when I got back to the States, um, I decided that it was appropriate for me to to write my own script, right? So to I would control what I was doing. And um, and as I've said before in the past, Prince would have a way of, um, it was just his way. It wasn't positive or negative. I guess it was more negative in a sense. But he would, if he was done with a discussion with you, he would just turn his back to you and say, thanks. Mm-hmm. And that was, he would just go, um, thanks. And that was like, oh, I guess I'm supposed to leave now, right? This is time for me to leave. That's my cue. And um, I always wanted to be on the front end of that. I didn't want to suffer that over and over. So I would just, if there was too long a pause, I would just, in a conversation, I would just say, all right, man. And I would just walk away. And um, in the building, like I would leave and I'd go back to rehearsal. Or I'd leave and I'd go to lunch or whatever it was. I would just say, all right, man. So as I said, it's, it was sort of a race between getting a thanks mm. or my saying, all right, man. So this was my way of doing, all right, man. So, uh, and when I landed, when I was on my way back, actually, um, when, when their plane landed in uh, Perth, I had... I had many, many messages, and, and uh, he wants to talk to you and things like that. And, and as difficult as it is for, for people to put their head around, I didn't feel like being reached. And it was, um, I was in a period where I, I don't walk away from things, so it takes quite a lot for me to have done that. Um, but it doesn't change. I, I'm, I'm not saying I wouldn't have walked away in retrospect. It's just sometimes there are times that you just people have to do for themselves, and they can't do for I feel for someone else. Yeah. So I'm glad at least I'm glad at least I was someone who said no. Interesting, man. Uh, and then uh, so you, Australia, you come back, uh, and you had not. Have you set foot in Paisley Park since you left? Only to do the Revolution show. Um, oh, okay. I didn't want to. <clears throat> Believe me, I did not want to go back to Paisley Park. I kind of wanted to leave it um, with the spirit of. As a matter of fact, I didn't. I figured that when I when all that went down and he he uh, passed, I thought, well, it took me some time to process it or be emotional about it, um, weeks and weeks, maybe a, a month or so. Um, and actually, then after I processed it, I thought, well, that's the end. That's the that's it. That's you know now it, that's over. So that chapter is closed, and I just don't have to revisit that. And I was clearly intending on not having anything to do with anything purple again. Just it, it was just over, and I wouldn't be one of these people that just tries to hang on and and make that the most important thing in my life. Because a lot of people who've worked with Prince, the thing that they're going to say is, "What's the most important thing you've done in your life?" And they'll mention Prince. And to me, that's not. It's just one of the things I've done. I did as much, um, I think, good for him as as he did for me. And that's sometimes people don't like to hear that, but I, I gave everything. And uh, I did my best, and that's all you can ask of people. And, and he, I got so much from him. I received so much from that man. As far as the way things work and what artists want and how to give them, always give them A game and always consider that that, the, that day, Prince told me once that the day you're in today is the most important day of your career. And I've always repeated that mantra. Mm-hmm. Today is the most important day of my career. Not what I've done. That just shows where I've been. But today, no matter where we are, what artists, what artists it is with whom I'm working, that is the most important day is today. And um, he was very aware of that, very in the moment. That's why when people say, oh, Prince and I were old friends. And Prince told me once, he said, I don't have any old friends. Wow. And so I think he was very much about today. And, um, and um, so I thought I was out. And then Bobby called. Bobby Z called and said, um, we, you're the right guy. You're the perfect guy for this. You're, you're uh, um, I'm probably paraphrasing, but in a way I sort of, um, the revolution was with him a long time ago and I was with him um, not quite that far back, but I was with him a long time ago and then a short time ago. So I sort of encapsulate that. So I was sort of in it together with him and as people mm-hmm. who knew him. And um, they brought Takumi on board, Takumi Suetsugu, who is his longtime right-hand man, a guitar tech, and, and um, uh, ran Paisley Park for many, many years, um, nine or ten years. So got us back together with the revolution. And so it started all over again. 
Wow. I want to jump into the revolution, but I want to ask you one question before I do that. I'm just curious, in your dealings with Prince and, and being around him, just on a, this may sound weird, on a man-to-man level, what kind of man was he? What kind of guy was he? Take, I'm not, take away all the celebrity and all that. What kind of guy was Prince to you in your observation? Um... What kind of man was he? He was uh, a gentleman. <clears throat> Everyone is going to answer that. They're going to say he was funny, right? That's the standard answer is like, oh, he was funny. People don't know that about him. He was super funny. And he was funny, but that's not who he was as a man. Who he was was um, aware. He was a very aware person. He was acutely aware of every single one of his moves and how they were being perceived, um, possibly to a fault. But um, but he he understood his place. He understood what he meant to people, and he was fiercely loyal to his fans, which makes him a good man and a good person. And he um, uh, he was a gentleman. And I remember that about him. He was he's always very good at manners, and that's not something you hear. But I always noticed that he had a very particular um, grace. He was elegant as a person. He was an elegant person. He conducted himself elegantly and in good manner, very graceful. And, um, and he would give people a chance to bring what they had to what he was doing. And when you showed that you didn't have the capac- capaciousness or, or capacity, rather, of if you weren't capacious and didn't have that, and he w- watched you for a second, if you didn't have something to bring, you would quickly be out of that circle, out of, the, out of his life, out of that circle, out of that job. But if he'd noticed you'd, somebody did have something to bring and it was important, then you stayed or you were called back. And I think that's why I was called back many, many times over many, many years for different projects. And um, But he was he was a good man and he, he uh, was a great artist. A lot of people are good artists. He was a great artist, artistic and a great artist. It's hard to find people um, about whom we can say that, that are, that are great, truly great. And genius is a word that's passed around way too heavily nowadays. Um, but I don't think uh, it's any question that he was genial in the way he, he thought and what he did and his influence on music. Um, hugely influential and very, very underappreciated as evidenced by his record sales going up only after his death, right? Mm. If that if he were truly appreciated, he, there was record sales would have been flatlined, been been still high and continue to be the same after his death or just gone up slightly. But because they went up some crazy percentage, like 22,000% or something, right? That means that people went, oh no, man, I right. really should have been on this when I had a chance. I really wish I would have seen him live. Mm. And for someone who saw him live, probably, th- I don't know, probably thousands of times, right? Thousands of shows, um, uh, at least in the high hundreds, um, I can say that he was a very, very special and unique person. Very, very um, uh, important. All right. Um, so I'm just kind of regrouping myself as I'm listening. The revolution reunited, back on the road again. Uh, obviously, it would have been great if they were able to have done this with Prince, but they're together now. What? Uh, and so. You, you talked about getting back with, you know, working with them. They're calling you. And how does that work in terms of, you know, they haven't played as a band uh, for quite a long time in terms of really getting out there playing in front of people. And, of course, they don't have the, you know, the main piece of that. The Prince part is not there. Uh, but how do they come back? And, and this is maybe a question for them, but in terms of how you help them. How's the process to to play the music and to get the sound properly? Because the Revolution stuff was, you know, the drum machine sounds was heavy during those concerts yeah. back in the day. You know, that was a part of the sound. It wasn't no just straight drumming going on. It was a lot of stuff going on. So how do they get back into the game for that? Well, it was uh, the first thing I did after Bobby called and and Bobby Z and and Matt Fink, Dr. Fink wanted to meet with me and just to have a meeting and discuss what they were going to do. And, and I uh, listened and then I said, well, there's several ways we can do this. You know, we can do it like this or this or this. And, and, um, 
<clears throat> they really start. We're starting from the ground up again as a new as a band, almost like a new band because it had been so long since they played. And um, different members were active and in different ways with Prince and his music over all those years. But they hadn't come to le- together collectively uh, other than Bobby's um, Heart Association show, and I think it was 2012, right? Something I believe like that, so. Yeah. I could be wrong. And then. Um, uh, and then the shows in 2016 after his passing, passing the, the shows at first half. Uh, but they, they, um, they needed uh, or asked for my help in getting that going again. And how would I do it? And so I had sec- several recommendations, one of which would be to sit with, with Bobby and go through all of his sounds. Because you want to, obviously, you want to, um, uh, they wanted a different sound. Mark Brown, Brown, uh, Brown Mark, who's instrumental in, in creating this new sound, new technology and he he embraced the new technology and had been used to it and um lisa and wendy who they score tv shows so they they clearly they're up on technology probably more than all of us combined and they they know what they're looking for and you have five very different members and their and their and their approach is different but they come together and they form this really powerful band and um uh i think it was eric leeds who told me i said i asked eric leeds Leads once I said, who is fully thinking he was going to say the band in 87, like the Love Sexy band, right? I said, who is Prince's greatest band? And and he said, the revolution. And I said, really? He said, they're the only band he ever had, the only real band he ever had, because they were at in those times. They were in the genesis of all this, and they were part of the creation of all this incredible, iconic, and, and legacy material. They were truly a band. And that's not to take... I, know that instantly takes away from all the other uh, factions of uh, all the other uh, formations of bands that Prince put together and not to denigrate or take anything away or or do addition by subtraction. I'm just saying that I would happen to agree. And for Eric to say that about a band that he was in late right. uh, um, is powerful as well. Wow. Um, and they so- needed um, they just needed some uh, some get up and go like how are we going to do this and so i said well let me listen we bobby rented some time in a studio we listened to all his loops some of which went way back into the um the mid and late 80s some of those loops were that old and i said no we got to replace all these we have to we, we, we want the whole production to sound a certain way you know and and bobby was adamant about that as well and making it sound you know make, making it sound seamless so one thing didn't sound really old and mm-hmm. mono and and raggedy and then the next thing sounded really new and a lot of productions can suffer like that when you're covering that much time. So I, I recreate. I started from scratch, recreated all the loops, sourced out the, all the Lin sounds at different tunings, made all the loops, passed them around. Didn't hear any objections. We started putting together rehearsal. I brought in a really a real stud of a an a Ableton playback uh, engineer named Eric Morris, who would, I work with on Lady Gaga and uh, the Frey and. Um, Oh, we've done a few, we've done a f- several tours together and he's really, really musical and he knows how to put a, a rig together. And remember, this is something that Prince never did, nor would he, nor would he uh, allow. Yeah, I'm sorry, to, you said Ableton, like the program Ableton? Ableton. Interesting. I've the program that. Ableton. It's, it, it's, um, and Ableton is really the, 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 the go-to for live playback of, of, um, of tracks. There's a lot you can do with it. It's not an endorsement of it. It just happens to be what most people use now no, in the I, game. I, I've actually used that to create some songs. I've heard of people doing shows with that, but I didn't understand how they were doing it. So that just fascinates me. Yeah, and and uh, Eric is. Um, I think I described Michael Bland as Doctor Octopus, and I could, with a lot of, I can assure you that that Eric is truly the the genius back there on stage, right, doing all that and putting it together. So I knew to, to plug the right person in to musically get everyone on the the right path it, you had all these cooks everybody in that band is a cook you know they're all a chef actually they're not just line cooks or sous chefs they're all chefs they all have their own musicality and um to bring them together and to get it to formulate and have one sort of sound to it and not just be a legacy sound but say hey, we're going to curve this one a little bit make it sound like this or we're going to do this song like that we're going to speed this one up because i always felt it should be here um that was done, and we stayed true to the legacy sound, but also brought a different energy to it. And then you have Stokely Williams from Mint Condition, um, among other bands. Stokely is uh, um, a perfect choice, in my uh, estimation, to do lead vocals because he was he had the Prince stamp of approval. 
mm. right? Prince loved him as, an, as a performer, as a uh, vocalist. And he was from Minneapolis and understood, and he understands the sound, but he's also reverential. He's not looking for his own airtime to get out there. And, mm. and he's being reverential to Prince the artist. He knows where to play. He knows it's all about placement, right? right? And Stokely is reverential with the placement of the material and his vocal, and he doesn't try and sound like Prince, and he's not trying to... No one's trying to replace Prince in that band. That's the thing thing that Wendy always says that's very, very wise is that there is no replacing him. That the crowd has really, at these shows, the crowd has become the lead vocalist. And it's quite fun. To, it's fun for me to look around and see everyone singing every lyric to every song. And they, people, you know, laugh during the show. They, they certainly, they cry when a certain a couple of numbers are performed. And, and it's been fun. And just when I thought I was fully out, um, I got that call. And so it's been fun to put that together and do things that even Bobby who, as many fans know, is a heart patient, has a you know has heart issues in the past, and and we wanted to make it easier for him to not have to play all this stuff and work like mad back there, but just to really be able to enjoy the music, and play along with these loops and get along with them, and introduce click tracks to the band, which a lot of them had never worked with click tracks, mm. and um, and make it really a musical experience for the fans. That's they were adamant that that it would be musical and that it would be reverential and respectful and really be for the fans. And I can tell you firsthand that that this uh, um, it, the, the biggest gain going on in any way is for the fans. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm excited for it, man. I, I, I bought a ticket uh, to the show that's coming here. I know Big Sexy is going uh, when it comes to his town. And it sounds like the shows have been received greatly. Like uh, It's just a, it's almost a celebrational type of vibe, you know. Um, yeah, well, en- enough time has passed where now we're in the celebration of mm-hmm. it. And, you know, we've gone through the year of first, right? So you've, you've been through the first this and the first June 7th and the first right. this and the first that. So once you get through that year of firsts, then after that, it can things can kind of open up. And um, you, with, with the revolution, you're dealing with five people who are very busy in other aspects of their life. And they've... Mm-hmm. Um, decided to come together to be a part of this because it's important. It serves a different, it's serving something um, else for all of us as well. Uh, now, this, is a, this is a funny question. Is, is, uh, is the doctor, is he wearing his doctor uniform? Matt has no problem yeah, reaching man. back into the, that's, that's um, what I'm talking about. and that's because he's, he's inextricably linked with, um, to me, if I were a doctor's outfit, I'd still have a doctor's outfit yeah. because it's, to me, it was a cool aspect, of, and it was something that, I don't know, I'd have to ask Matt whether or not Prince came up with that, or he did, or that was probably a Prince thing, I'm guessing, but but um, uh, that's a, a real identifiable way for us to recognize Matt, and and uh, I mean, nobody wants to try and say, well, well, let's squeeze back into these pants that I wore, let's put on this Victorian collar, right, let's do I'm this. saying it's y'all not should. about that, it's because that, <laughs> no, I, it's, it's um, there, the, the beauty of it is that there's a maturation that has happened to everyone, sure. not only as a performer, but as a person. And so we, we are generally, um, I think it, it makes it more important that we're bringing back um, who we are now. But with this band, you're getting the real band. You're not getting this guitar player that never actually played with Prince. Right, right. right? Or you're getting this background singer who never played with Prince, but the MD is so-and-so, so they're in the band. It's not like that. This is, These are the five members from the movie and it really is about that era and it's about the creation and the just sheer volume and co- of content that was created in that era and how special that is mm-hmm. and not just the purple rain era i'm talking about afterward too parade. is when he talks about frequently during the show yeah parade and around the i mean there's so much really really important stuff was in that era and, and that goes for me as well for being reverential to what prince did engineering wise and what susan did um Susan Rogers did with Prince. So I'm trying to stay true to certain engineering aspects of it. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm going to slug out an old, uh, haul out a big old analog desk because there are certain things that I want, want to be able to do. I want to be able to multi-track. I want to be able to um, do content capture and things that we, those things that are in the industry that that never existed back then, even in, when I was running sound for Prince. So, um, but we want to be able to take advantage of the modern uh, mm-hmm. the modern technology to, to present this stuff in a way that the fans really want to experience. And it really has been all about the fans, the fan, out, the outpouring of support and and love for this 
has been um, overwhelming. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm glad they did it, man. And uh, has there been any, again, this may be a question for you. I'm just curious. Has there been any conversation that you're aware of where they thought, let's, let's make a, a new song or something new or something? I'm just curious. Um, that's a good question question it hasn't come across me if so um all five of the members of the revolution are writers Mm -hmm. so they're going to um that's always on the table and um i guess it would be um i don't want to postulate any theory on that i just it hasn't come up but um but i know i know digging into old stuff that they wrote together with prince has come up because they're doing um um, our destiny in Roadhouse right, Garden. Right, right. Before those got released, uh, recently, uh, they were doing them from the first day, um, the mm-hmm. first show, which was at Paisley Park. So, um, nice. So it's it's more about digging out vault stuff now and playing stuff that the, the one of the many songs they did together. All right. Um, let's let's go back because there's a couple of um, releases that we must talk about specifically, uh, the One Night Alone live album which was Prince's first you know, live album release. That was a box set. That was such a big deal when that came out. I, I remember that. Uh, I was so excited about that. And this was the One Night Alone shows. I always call them like the Rainbow Children type shows right. or whatnot. Um, and that band, that was a fantastic band. Man. Oh, you, yeah. You know, that, that was, they had Maceo. And, and Eric Lees came back a little bit sometimes. I think, I think in. Or was that in, after that? In, um, it it was uh, Eric was back during that. Um, Eric was on that tour. Um, was it Greg Maceo and Eric? It could have been definitely um, Greg. Yeah, Candy was there. It was yeah. I, I, it uh, it covered. They're covered different members, and and then I get it confused with the December show uh, at the live at the Aladdin Las Vegas, which mm. kind of came on the heels of that. Um, uh that tour and um but uh uh yeah great band renato neto renato, yeah, who yeah. was in renato because I, I met renato in sheila's band he was sheila e's uh keyboard player so we met on my very first tour and it was fun to have him be back in the band he's a monster player great player very musical guy and so john blackwell of course mm-hmm. so um we have naji and, and that was fun because uh naji was on some of those shows because i remember uh, I remember seeing his name, seeing my hand written. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't remember that until you said it, but I remember writing Naji on the on the soundboards all the time. Um, and uh, Mike Phillips, is that right? Michael Was Mike Phillips, Phillips some, yeah. some of those? Yeah. Phillips, yeah. Um, and so we had a lot of different, a litany of different players that would come in and out during that era. But um, uh, that was fun because that was totally unexpected. I, I think even for Prince to put out that record, he... He uh, would get the dats back from me every night. It was usually two dats a night because we'd go over two hours. So I would have two two-hour dats. So you'd probably have two and a half to three hours every show during that era. And I would turn them in right away. And they would send them in a clump every week or so. They would send them back to Paisley Park. Dave Hampton, whom I introduced to Prince in two, the end of 2002. Dave was running the facility at that point from 2003, 2002 on. Um, to maybe 2007, eight, nine, whenever Dave, Dave ended up being with Prince. But they would they would take the dats and put them all in the, check them, make sure the audio quality was there, and then put them down in the vault, catalog them. And, um, and then at some point, Prince must have had enough time on his hands, and he started listening back to the dats and saying, oh, this is a record right here. Matter of fact, I have a good, there's a good quote of Prince saying at that uh, New Year's Eve show in 2016, it, it had just turned 2016, midnight and um prince said oh that's a live record right here you know where he where he was always aware right he was always cognizant of what he was doing whether or not that was a releasable sellable item right that was always in his review so um uh and it was during one of kirk solos that he that he was saying that and so um uh it was but it was a surprise to me because i, I didn't know anything about him amassing a, a live record until uh, I think his assistant was Lynn at the time, and she came up to me and said, "Yeah, he's he's putting a live record together um, of all your of all those mixes, and he wants you to write something for the record." And and of course, he Prince had a lot of ideas, and 
and only a tiny portion of which would ever be realized. So I didn't think much of it, and I kind of put it off, actually, if I remember correctly now. And then she said, no, 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 he, you really you got to do something for me. I'm on the line here. you got to get me something. And I said, what does he want? She said, I don't know. Just write something about the record. And I said, well, what is it? She said, oh, it's the, it's the show. It's the, the whole show from the tour, but from different cities. And then there's an after show disc as well. And I said, really? She said, yeah. <laughs> so, but then I, all I had to do was think about it a little bit and think, we did some after show. I think it was Portland where Prince, before the after show, he came up to me and he said, um, he said, we're not going to do a long after show. Um, but what I really need to, you to record is when I... At the end of the after show, I'm going to get the crowd saying it ain't over, and I'm going to turn the mic toward the crowd, and I really need you to record that, hmm. them saying that. Wow. And so, he, again, he was cognizant of what he was do mm -hmm. doing. He had that plan the whole time because that stemmed from something George Clinton said at the New York after show, which was, it ain't over. <laughs> it ain't over. He started chanting it, right? So when, so when we did this after show up in the West uh, Pacific Northwest somewhere, he said, um, we did about an hour after show, which is funny because that's not long for him. And at the end, he said, it ain't over. And then he put his hand to his ear and the crowd started saying, it ain't over. It ain't. And then he turned the mic toward him and waved like, ah, oh, y'all don't understand. And he went off stage and they kept going. Then he ran back on stage, I think, and put his ear up again and they kept chanting it. And he, then he left the venue. <laughs> and when I left, I had to head to, the, to his hotel to give them the dad. And he said, did you get it? And I said, yeah. And I gave him the dad. So he was interested in getting the crowd recorded saying it ain't over because he knew he was going to mix that in wow. with the George Clinton after show. So he was, he was keenly aware and I just didn't see it. I was too close to the process. He was the chef again. So he um, put that box set together and released it and I wrote a nice um, essay in the center of it um, that he liked quite a bit. He had paid me compliments on a couple of different occasions after that about that uh, an essay about being his drum tech and then being his sound engineer and mm. And the after show. So it was a, that was a nice feather in my cap because people just don't do that. You know, they don't. Right. You're, you're not going to have Katy Perry really. It's a, 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 a live two track recording, you know, right off the board of a, a two hour show and then a, an hour of after shows. It, they, they just wouldn't do that. Nobody's brave enough. So that was a huge thing. Wow, man. That's 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 in the books, man. That's... And I didn't even really realize that 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 was his only live recording. Or that, or excuse me, his first live recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's crazy. Now, did you also work on the Musicology tour? I did. I, I mixed front of house for Musicology as well, and I think that's where we got. Uh, isn't that where we got the uh, the uh, C note? No, no, no. That might have been two thousand two. Ah, who knows? Uh, the, everything sort of bleeds into one <laughs> into one era, but um, but yeah, Musicology was a unique challenge because it was sort of quad sound, kind of. Prince wanted, but just firing out instead of in, right? It was in the round, firing out toward the crowd. So I was happy. Interesting. That, and, that, and again, the band at this point, you know, I look at some of these, the footage from that show, excuse me, and I kind of took that for granted, but when I look at it now, I'm like, man, everybody was on fire. Like, just the energy level was so bananas. Like, Prince is just like, that's to me when he's just like a super showman. Because he's just yeah. nonstop and he's in the middle of everything, so you can't just stop and rest. Like he's just doing his thing, and the, he's got the, some of the best people playing in the band. And don't forget that he. This is at the height of his, you know, his hip issues too, as well. So you had two thousand four, oh. well, where, where, and you're talking about an artist who was really known as at least a big portion of what he did was very physical, jumping and mm -hmm. sliding and splits. <clears throat> but you didn't notice that. You didn't miss that. And why is that? It's because he had so much else in the tank. For musicianship think of other performers of that era if you took away their movement you right. take away their whole show right yeah, that's true i can think of two big ones right even, even so, my guy um, mj like you take away there you go you, know. you take away if he if he throws it if he you well, know if he does a hip flexor you, that's it you, you just have to off. sit down and sing which he is sit a down incredible and singer too but i understand what you're right. saying yeah, so you got so Prince just needed to decide how deep he wanted to go. So he said, "Well, I'm just going to play guitar a lot on this." And he played guitar, and you notice he didn't pick up a trumpet because that's not what he did well. So he he only did what he did well, and he did many many things well. So that was a fun tour because it was all the hits then. Mm. Um, One night alone live, 
uh, the Rainbow Children era was he was he was saying something else in that era, and um, in 2004 he he was uh, it was back to the hits and and it was fun, fun show to mix too. <laughs> I can imagine, man. Um, were you did you do any of the um, Third Eye Girl stuff? I didn't. Um, I, I Prince introduced me to the three ladies when. When he put them together and they were rehearsing it at Paisley Park, and I think that was, oh man, was that 2012 when I came out there? 2011, something. He invited me out there. We talked. Um, we had a good multi-hour talk. I went home, and a day or two later, or maybe it was the next Monday, I got a call to come out there again and talk with him during the day. And we talked for a while. And he said, "I want to introduce you to the ladies." Um. Uh. I'm going to turn them into a female version of Led Zeppelin. That was his quote. <laughs> so um, they were rehearsing in the big room, and I went up and met them all. And, and then he had me take them out for coffee. It was kind of interesting the way he kind of played it. But he said, I listened to them. We, Prince and I listened to them play a little bit. And then he said, um, y'all want to get coffee? And so I think it was Hannah, jo- uh, Hannah and her husband – I, I, all three ladies and Josh got in, got in uh, one vehicle and Prince and I got in his cattle. He had some like little black Cadillac sports car. And we went over to a coffee house and I said, well, are you coming in? And he said, no, Josh is going to sit out here with me and um, you're going to have coffee with them, meaning the ladies. Hmm. And, and I said, oh, okay. And he said, you know what to talk about. That, that was it. You know what to talk about. And so I went in there and I... We, I said, I said, well, let's just, let's sit in here and talk. And then we just sort of talked for about a half an hour. And I asked them questions and I said, wow, what a great opportunity. And you're doing stuff, you know, that you're, this will set you up musically and in uh, to learn a lot. And we talked for about a half an hour. And when we came out, uh, Josh got out of Prince's car. I think they were listening to music. Josh got out, got back into his vehicle. <clears throat> I got into Prince's car and shut the door. And he said, well, how did that go? And I said, well, school was in. <laughs> and he said, that's what I'm talking about. So he, I love that. So we didn't have to discuss what it was, or he didn't have to say, what did you ask him? What did you say? It was more of an unspoken thing. You just had to know that thing, you know? And I, I, um, there were times that I was better at it than others, and times that he didn't want to hear from me, and times that he didn't use me as a live sound engineer. And that was fine, because he, he went through his phases as well. He did that with musicians. I mean, why anybody... The example I would cite is once you have Michael Bland in the band, why would you ever use anyone else? Well, the, and the, I guess the answer is because you don't want, you don't need Michael Bland for this project. You don't want him for this project. He's not right for everything. So that helped me cope with saying, oh, wow, you know, he really should have called me for, for this or that thing or that thing he did over there. Mm-hmm. You know, why didn't he call me for this? I never, I never really had to suffer that, um, those questions because I knew that if he wanted you, he would call on you and, and as they say, as they say, many are called, few are chosen. Wow! It, it sounds like he, you know, he kind of had you sort of put them up on, on the game, and like, this is who you're about to get with. Let, let me sh- let me drop some stuff on you because I've been working with them, and here's what y'all can look forward to. It's kind of kind of you know what I'm saying? Like he's like, yo, let me get Scotty because he understands what my whole situation is about when I'm working with these people. So let them let him, let him holler at him. And, and put them up on I, the situation. That's I wouldn't pretend. I, I, that's what it sounds like, and that's what it felt like to me. And I, if a bet, being a betting man, I would say that's what he was doing. But that that doesn't mean that I'm going to again theorize at his mindset. Oh, I didn't sure. know. We weren't. We weren't. I wouldn't call us. Well, I wouldn't call us friends. He in Australia when things were really going sideways in 2016. Um, he would call me into the quick change room. And he'd say, are we friends? And I said, my initial reaction was, I don't know how to answer that. And he said, are we friends? And then he turned, instead of looking at me in the mirror, he turned and looked at me. You know, turned right around in the chair and said, are we friends? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, then be my friend and quit mixing. You know, he thought I was mixing him or turning things on and off and up and down. And I really wasn't. I was just sitting hmm. back there and letting the show, that show kind of mixed itself. Um, but, 
I, I wouldn't call us friends. I don't know how many friends he really had. Um, you know, you, and a lot of people like to say, oh, I just heard of an old manager of his that said, oh, he was the loneliest person I knew. And I said, well, yeah, but it wasn't your lonely. That's not your lonely. Your lonely is different. By your definition, that's lonely, you know, that person's lonely. And, but unless, I just think his ideals were different. And I think his relationship and how he viewed people was different. And it was mm -hmm. so different that his, his black was your white. It was a different thing. So we can't put our definitions or, or postulate what we think he was thinking on him. He had a certain way of doing th things. If he that worked with you and was in concert with you, then I think it worked. Um, and if it, if it didn't, then you quickly left working with him. And I always say with him and not for him because, you know, he couldn't do what I did. Uh, he just couldn't, he couldn't do what a lot of people did. And, um, so we worked together. We worked in concert together. I mean, literally in a concert. And then we also worked together in, in tandem and, and doing what we did. And right. we did a lot of good work together. It was really fun. And I still, every artist that I, with whom I work now, they'll always at some point kind of say, well, you know, what did Prince do here? Or what would he do? <laughs> right. WWPD, right? And, <laughs> and, and, um, and I say, well, you know, he might do this or have you thought about this? And um, because he just made so many wise choices uh, musically, so many impactful wise choices. Yeah, I can imagine you would get that because, you know, I would imagine for a lot of artists, and you even mentioned Maxwell, when they, if, if I was to find out that you had worked with Prince, that alone is a, such a pedigree and yes. a certain level of excellence that an expectation, particularly from a, uh, an artist, musician standpoint, where I'm sure they would be like, yo, as you said, how did Prince do it? Or what would he do in a situation like that? How did y'all do it with him? Because the way you did, I wanted exactly like that. Because I think in, in a lot of people's minds, the level of excellence is so high that, you know, mm. so it was imagine if you was able to work with Prince, then I'm good because... You know, that's why I think when Seal and them coming at you, he knows the pedigree. I want yeah. my shit to be just like that, like, because that's the high, high watermark. So I can. Uh, yeah. So when I would look at you, I'd be like, yeah, whatever Scotty say, because he worked with the best. So he already know <laughs> I want my shit to be on the level of Prince and them. And he the one that made that. So, you know. I guess I'm I'm glad I'm too close to be able to read those edges because I, although I'm acutely aware and I'm fully aware of um, the amount of pedigree and experience I have with really artistic people, it it's when I'm in there trying to do it, I'm doing it for the sake of that person's music or that group's music. It's not because I'm not it's not in a response to what I did with Prince, right? So for me, it's always about, if it's Duran Duran, we're discussing the song Wild Boys, I said, well, you know, we might want to do this, and da-da-da. And it all, be, it all comes from my experience of working with Prince, and then what I have, right. have brought, what I brought to Prince as well. But it's, it's really in service to the material of whatever that band is and whatever that artist is. If they want to look at pedigree, <clears throat> certainly that is a pedigree that I've been able to take. And when I mentor engineers that are coming up, I always tell them, you know, be yourself, be yourself, and you, you know, today's your most important day. And I can, I can throw a few of those out there. And I've gotten a lot from Dave Hampton, a lot of wisdom from Dave Hampton. I've got mm. gotten a lot from Prince himself. But at the end of the day, it's just how I filter it, and it's how how I. Um, yeah. That's why I was talking to Big Sexy earlier about, and he said, "Wow, I'd love to be an engineer." I'd love to do be an engineer, and you can be an engineer if you want to be. You can. There was never there was never a can't or. A, I don't want to, or, 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 or I don't think I can do that. It's, you can, and, um, and it's, uh, it's all possible. And I think it's, our mind is the only limit there and it's all about the work. It's, it's mm. about doing good work and doing it for the right reason. I never, ever sit back on the fact that I mix a lot of big artists as being, um, I don't drag that, that foot behind me or try and spike the ball too hard about that. I'm, I'm, I'm always about servicing the material. Because artists can be really fickle, man. They can be very difficult to deal with um, or with whom to deal. They can be very – and so can the crowd. So can what the crowd says. Oh, it's too loud. You know, it was, mm -hmm. I couldn't hear the lead vocal. I couldn't – so the thing that I always try and work with and work for, the thing I will be in service to is the material, the songs. Mm -hmm. And what a great body of work to service uh, now this year for me. 
um, when I thought it was over. I get to see all these. I did. I don't tweet much, but I did tweet. A, a, I was mixing a show, and I never take out my phone during the show. I just never do it. It's not um, actually officially. I didn't take it out during a show. It was a sound check. Stokely was sound checking before a show, and I looked down and I saw "Baby I'm a Star" on my on my console. I saw the the title and I saw the the meters pumping during that song, and I thought, "Wow." Like I, I thought I would never thought I would see that again on my desk, <laughs> ever, right? And and so I took a picture of that and I tweeted it before a show that I never thought that I would see that again on my desk. And I'm glad I'm still able to service the material, the man as well, and the legacy, right? See, and the band because I love this band. The Revolution are um, some of the brightest and most accomplished um, musicians that I've met, and um, I shouldn't be taken lightly, um, and. But the material is really what I'm after servicing. I really work as hard as I can for the songs because all of them have a life and people have a connection to a certain song. Maybe it's Dorothy Parker. Maybe it's uh, The Question of You. Maybe it's something really obscure. Um, uh, but I like to do the best I can for the songs and let all that fall, let all the other chips fall where they may. All right. Uh, Big Sexy, I want to give you the opportunity. Do you have any other questions you want to ask? <coughs> yeah, I got a couple of techie head questions. Uh, hmm. For you, Scott. One you mentioned earlier, uh, in today's recording technology, a lot of things are recorded higher resolutions and sampling rates. Now, I always give Michael Dean credit for this. He got me into buying a lot of music that has been you know, trans or delivered to me via internet. And I got turned on to a company that does things in 2496. Now, for you, is that something you, as a sound guy, would seek out, or do you just go with the forty-four sixteen resolution? Um, it depends. I record in forty-eight twenty-four, forty-eight K twenty-four bit. Um, I run my console at thirty-two bit, um, and you can download FLAC files, high, high res files. Every all these companies are now uh, record companies are taking their back catalog and converting them to one ninety two twenty four. Right, so you've got these one hundred ninety two k twenty four bit files. All these numbers mean absolutely nothing. It doesn't matter if you could if you break out a cassette tape. How about an eight track? When I bought an old hoopty once, I bought a maybe a, <laughs> I bought a seventy six uh, old Cutlass. Right, and in that seventy six Six Olds Cutlass. It was kind of a faded gold. It was a really shitty car, but it was still one of my favorite cars. Stuck in the eight track player was Tower Power back to Oakland. Wow. Right. It wouldn't come out of the eight track player. And I couldn't play the radio. It was Tower Power back to Oakland or nothing. <laughs> and um, so I learned every. I tried, huh? To do my best. Like, I, I learned every song on Back to Oakland just from listening to, to that because that. I had to. It didn't matter that it was on a track, and all my memories have nothing to do with a flak file or a ninety-six K twenty-four bit. That doesn't mean anything. I think Susan Rogers covered that really aptly. I was nodding to the point of hurting my neck when she was talking about it. Doesn't have to do with that stuff. It has to do with the feeling that it constitutes and what pulls up from within you, mm. um, or pours o over you, um, because of what you're hearing, not the not the technology. People would probably disagree vehemently nowadays more than ever but I, I i think it has very little to do with the sample rate there the bit rate or the method of delivery that's it's only air amplified sand as dave hampton likes to say um if it's not a good song it all has to do with the material and how it moves you. So, frankly, there's some stuff. Like, for example, I've never said this to anyone before. I've never intimated this thought. I prefer, when I'm driving in a car alone, to listen to AM radio. Wow. I love wow. AM radio. I love how it sounds. I love the tight bandwidth. And I like that it it, it it's evocative. It, it invokes a feeling of a youthfulness, like when I was a kid, right? And how I'd listen to an old Pablo Cruz song or something from when I was a kid oh, on AM radio. Radio. Pablo Cruz now, I will. Oh, yeah. Right? So, and all that does is it, it has to do with the psychology. And again, Susan would be a great person to ask about this. You could do another full podcast of the psychology of, of music mm. and what it does to our memories. But for me, listening to AM radio when I'm alone is great. I don't like the high fidelity. I want to hear music in lo-fi when I'm in my car. 
Um, and it's just something weird. I don't, I don't, I don't demand high fidelity stuff, but on a show, we want to give high fidelity just so that the content's delivered in an even way and dispersed in an even way. If I thought, for example, if I, if there's a song that I'm mixing that was very monophonic in a, sh on a show, I, I might not necessarily make it a mono. Um, I might not mix it in a monophonic like way just because it was on the, the record like that right there are other things that have it has to do with i won't stray too far but i will give you one story um tegan and sarah who are favorites of mine um i i came across they came across me and sought me out and i mixed them and they're you know canadian twin sisters and and indie very indie rock and they've had a long successful career and had a few hits in the last few years um crossover hits and um I, conceptually I said to them what I say to every artist. Do you want the the show, the entire show, to sound like the new record? Or do you want it to sound like each song sounds like it does on its respective album? And most artists, almost all of them say, oh, I want it to all sound like the new record. Because they all love their new record, right? Whatever their new record is, that's what we love. So there are ways I can do that. I can take keyboard patches and I can take kick drum samples and different drum samples and I can put them into older songs, right? It kind of marries all the material together and that all kind of sounds a certain way, the show. Um, to my surprise, Tegan said, no, we want our old stuff to sound old and sound like it did on the record and make the new stuff big, big and lush and wet and wide and make it sound fat and keyboardy. And then when we play this song, we'll go right back to that old sound. They didn't mind the dynamic of the change of sound. And which I thought was awesome and brave. And, and it made the show to take on a certain color and feel. And it was great because they brought you right into that indie feeling. And then we went, the next song was closer with a, it sounded like a big Gaga song, right? Big, big wide song. So they didn't mind doing that. That has nothing to do with the quality of the audio or what it's being recorded at. It has to do with how they want to deliver their content. And it still has to do with content. And for me, that's the same way with recorded files now. I don't get hung up in the digitalness of what we're doing. Um, that's for record companies to preserve as a canon of, of someone's work in the body of their work. They want to preserve it digitally. I have no problem with that. Um, it doesn't mean you're going to release all the forthcoming print stuff from the era of the mid to early, early to mid 80s on vinyl and cassette. You don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, And Prince and I would have arguments uh, he, he challenged why I was using a digital desk. Um, and I said, hey, man, I, I just downloaded Fix Your Life Up on the way here in my car, and there was nothing analog about it. I said, unless we're willing to roll out um, big old desks and record it with, with uh, multi-track machines, we're doing this digital. So at some point, it's all going to turn digital anyway. And so I, I, my point was even further than Prince's. I, I, I don't think it mattered um, the format. I think it's the content that always makes the biggest difference. All right, great. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. That was now, the longest answer in the history. No, that's a great <laughs> answer. That's a great answer. You broke it um, down. Back, back in uh, 90, let's say 93, on the Act One tour, hmm. uh, you were a part of that. Now, I wanted to give you some, some dap because when that show came to San Francisco at the Bill Graham Civic, the first thing I heard when I sat down when the band came out was Michael Bland's drum tone. And I've heard a million drummers in a million settings, and I heard that, and I thought he was going to crack a rib with it. I'm like, no one hits like that. So that was you, and you did a great job on that. Thank you very much. I always try to capture Michael's um, size. I think he was, Michael's been... Um, uh, I have to be careful here. I don't think Michael is playing has always has been captured on recordings uh, the way he plays when you're next to him. You just can't capture his size and the amount of space that he leaves between these big hits is just incomparably thrilling to be next to him when he plays. And then to be out front, uh, but, but back in those days, I was behind him, and I was actually tuning his drums. I always try to make his tunings match his attitude and his um, um, his mood. And Michael would come in and say, 
I would tune the drums, the toms from the low, low, and then the middle, and then the top tom from the bottom. I would go do 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 do. Right, that was the tuning. But if Michael was in a bad mood, he'd come in and say, "Man, Scotty, make it minor." So I go do 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 do. He just wanted a minor tuning because he was feeling aggressive that day. So I go to that top tom and tune it down one note. It, it, when you got to that point, he wanted the snare to crack and to be really fat sounding and and just the way Michael struck. He he did as much good work for me, probably more than than I did for him. But he 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 knows how to hit with authority and he knows how to make it sound great. And he's he's aware. Talk about an awareness quotient. His AQ is off the charts because he knows exactly what he's doing when he's back there. And that was fun. That tour, I learned so much on that tour, and I got a lot of props from Prince. As a matter of fact, a lot of those bootlegs, it's me introducing the show. Really? Because um, when we got to Europe, Prince was doing the introduction. Was that was that where he started with My Name is Prince? Yeah. Um, the first several shows, Prince said uh, he would, they would all come on stage, lights would go out. All of us technicians would walk our player to the riser. So Levi had a guitar tech and... And Sonny had a guitar tech, and the keyboard players had Morris, and Tommy had guitar had keyboard techs, and I would walk uh, Michael back to it, over to his spot, and and Prince would then go into his quick change, do his makeup a little, and then they would hand him his mic, his his gun mic, and he would say, he would just disguise his voice and say, "Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Prince and the Revolution, or Prince and the New Power Generation," <laughs> right. And he had to disguise his voice because there was no one to do the introduction. Well, he he went maybe, I don't know how many shows in. Somebody knows this. But um, at one point, Prince would, you know, caught me fooling around when I was when Michael was walking to his riser. And I was walking him up to his riser. He said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Bland. <laughs> and he'd say, oh, shut up, Scotty. Man. And, and, he would, <laughs> and then I would take my seat. And, and Prince heard me at some point, must have heard me do that. Because the next thing I know, Joey, the security guy, said, man, he wants you. So I went over to the quick change, and a minute later, he opened the curtain and looked at me and said, can you introduce the show? And I said, sure. Just, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Prince and the new power. And I said, great. So I grabbed the mic, and I went, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Prince and the new power. Uh, right, and it went right into my name is Prince. And so the next night, I showed up, and just knowing that that was what he wanted, you know. So the next night I showed up, he opened the curtain, and that night he smiled really cute, too. He smiled, and, and he said, you do it again, but can you mention the city we're in? And I'm pretty sure it was in Den Bosch. I'm pretty sure that's the first, in Holland, that's the first city, because I said, I grabbed the mic and held it down away from my mouth. I said, oh, I'll do you one better, man. Watch this. And I said, Damus und Herren, und hard look applause for Prince and the new pop. And Prince said, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> And he took the mic and said, y'all ready? You know, whatever. And so every night I would show up and I would have a different cue card and I would read off the cue card and I would do it in the, in the language of the, uh, the local language. So a lot of those bootlegs start off with like, wow. you know, they, they start off, Senora, si, senoras. and that's always me backstage screaming into the gold gun mic. Um, <laughs> everyone was asked to do a lot of different things on those tours. But um, yeah, getting a great drum sound and getting a lot of uh, thanks from Prince. Not on the mic back then because I was a technician, but uh, throughout my career, I got a lot of thank yous over the PA from from Prince. Uh, a few scoldings as well, but most of the time it was it was uh, shout outs, and that that goes a long way in this industry getting shout outs from that man. I, I bet it does. Last last question, and I so appreciate your your time. Um, and this may be a two part question: What tour that you did you felt had the best sound? And also, what was your favorite tour of all the ones you've worked on? Good question. Um, the best sound might have been on in 2002 on One Night Alone. It's because everyone wore in-ear, in-ear monitors, so there was no stage sound. So it really sounded like a record every single night, and as evidenced by us getting a live record out of it. Although the, although the after shows had a bunch of really loud monitors at all the after shows and we still got a, a record out of that as well that that was i was really fully given control in that in 2002 to do whatever i wanted um but 2004 the material was more fun to mix because it was all the hits um so that i think was equally as good a sounding show and it was more exciting to mix because the it was more dynamic musically 
And um, and the second part was my what was the second question? Well, I was saying what was what was your favorite of, of all the ones that you worked on, just in general, favorite show, your favorite tour, um, excuse me. I have to say from from the the in from the standpoint of enjoyment it it has to be the one i'm on and i'll tell you why um mixing the revolution is something that i wanted to do for a long time and something i regretted not being able to do and then and it's the one thing i think uh that i can that i could theorize would be the thing that he didn't do which it would have been great as a last thing to do would be to come back and have shows with the revolution to me that would have been i love that he went out on his own solo um i would have loved to have seen him play with the revolution again especially i think he'd be very it's dangerous territory but i think he would be very proud of the job and there's not a day that goes by that i'm on this tour with the revolution that i don't think about i keep a picture of of prince and me on my computer that i hide Generally, I put stuff over it, but I keep it there to remind me that this is, I'm doing this for another reason. I'm doing it for, hmm. not just to make a living, but I'm doing this to service um, both him and the music itself and the fans and <clears throat> and the band. But I've not had a more enjoyable tour to be on than the one I'm on now. And I, I know that's kind of a, so it seems like a boilerplate answer, a, a standard answer, but it really is true. I, I've had more fun being reverential and and um uh enjoying the material again um than i've ever than i've ever had on any tour it's more fun and it's more um having a different thing having a different reason to do it and i was i was talking with the band oh maybe a month ago and i think i stumble on saying somehow that um it's great that they have a sound guy that um that worked with prints for so many years um and that's a good reason to have uh me as their sound engineer but what i said to him was that i think it was reverse and i think that all those years of being with prince were kind of preparing me to be on this tour with them Hmm. and in service of this material and that was um i probably stumbled on it a little bit uh less gratefully but um the my intention was the same that it's it's very good to be still a part of delivering his message to people that want to come out and hear it interesting all right man well ladies and gentlemen there you have had it that is mr scotty baldwin in the building what do you you call scotty p you can old friends i do have old friends they say (laughs) scotty p and when they see me i said oh i know when they knew me they knew me (laughs) Before nine, eight, nine years ago. Before he changed his uh, name to a symbol. I oh, took, sure. I took my. Yeah, okay. That was now yeah, that right. In a way, that's kind of my own name change. I took my wife's last name, um, in marriage. But uh, it's Scotty B is pretty close. And um, and uh, I have to thank you guys because I, I stumbled on your your podcast, and um, and uh, with Dave Hampton's urging, and I hope you have Dave on. Um, yes. Yes. With. At, at Dave's urging, he said, "Get out there and listen to what people are saying. This is your you can give your your oral your account of history and your body of work, and you can get the credit where you're due. And you know you can um, add to this, um, add to his legacy by being reverential to it, listening and and getting out there. And when I stumbled on your podcast, I was so blown away by your knowledge, not just encyclopedic knowledge, but your questions are great, and you guys have um, great." Um, inquiry and and curiosity and it's not always about it's about the off the beaten things it's about technical stuff and it's about how it relates though to feeling and and uh i appreciate you very very much that's why i sought you out to to talk with you and i would come on anytime you want to and talk about other things i'd love to uh, man i so uh, appreciate what you said and honored man and uh it's just because uh it's something you said i'm gonna tie it back into something you said repeatedly uh we're here to serve. It's just as you served the music and, and Prince and everybody that you work with, it's the same thing, man. I'm I'm trying to service back into uh, this legacy because it brought me so much joy just listening to the music and seeing this guy's work. So this is just another way of, hey, serve it on to the next person. So I, I appreciate you coming on and, and saying what you said. And, and, you, well, the, and you unlock the, you unlock more uh, 
some of the stories that we didn't get to know about, you know. So and and that's the thing is is archaeologically, <clears throat> his music will only go so far in telling his story, right? Mm-hmm. So then you have to look at old interviews that he did, and you'll have to start to unearth different personal accounts, right? So I think that I'm um, very aware that your that that this podcast we do today and your work is going to be looked at as part of the ar- archaeological unearthing of his legacy for years to come. So it's very important work w- you're doing right now, and you should be very proud of what you're doing. Well, thank you, man. And uh, you know, shout out to Big Sexy and Big Ken, uh, Day Drop, and all the rest of the brothers, Sean Hill, Aunt Pooh. You know, it's a, it's a family thing, so uh, that's what's up. Um, again, I also want to make sure that people uh, know where they can uh, find you online and, and read about you and uh, check out your website and stuff. Where, where can they find you, uh, Scott? Uh, you can find me at scottybaldwin.com, which is S-C-O-T-T-I-E. I should have bought them both. I should have bought the Y and the I-E, but <laughs> scottybaldwin.com. Yeah, and, and, and your um, Twitter? What's your Twitter handle? Twitter is, I think it's at, Twitter is at, right? At Scotty yeah. Baldwin? Yep. Okay, and... Um, Everything's Scotty Baldwin. It's Scotty Baldwin at me.com. Everything is Scotty Baldwin. So I kind of grabbed it before all the old General Hospital fans could grab their <laughs> <laughs> I think that happened the day after we, my wife and I got married. I said, I'm going to buy all of this up. And, uh, <laughs> well, wow, man. This is a lot to take in here. We got to listen to it a couple times uh, as usual. But again, uh, we we give you uh, we salute you, Scotty, for all the work that you've done so far and that you're going to continue to do for you touched a lot of people in your work. I should say when I saw you working with Maxwell, D'Angelo, Stevie Wonder, uh, Madonna, Lady Gaga, I was like, OK, wow, there's a lot that we can learn uh, from this guy. He, he didn't been in music for a very long time and you're still a bit relatively young guy. And I can, you know, and let me lastly say this. I think what's great what you bring to like with the revolution is you understand the ways that cats used to do their music before before the digital you understood what that means but now you know here's what technology enables us to do now and how we can use that to take it to a next level with the context of knowing how it used to be done and you respect that so i think that's why it's a great thing and even when i was listening to you talk about how they set up shows to today and how they have the click tracks and different things I understand it now because one, I see you have a respect for the old ways of doing it, but you know, hey, this is how we can take this and do it for the next way and make it even better, but not get complacent. You know what I'm saying? And not, you still got to keep your chops up. You still got to be a showman right. and all that. Right. So it's, it's a beautiful thing, man. I, I learned a lot here. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, you have to hit up Scotty on social media. Tell him thank you uh, for coming on the show. Um, also we thank you for listening right we also thank all of our donators and continuous of people that support us and what we're doing and as I always say after every show work it like a job we will see you next time peace